We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. So a bunch of New Hampshire state senators walk into a bar. I don't know where that's going. I just... <laughs> unarmed, no doubt, right? Because unarmed, no doubt. No well, doubt. some of them, I would disagree with you. Well, they wouldn't be walking in together. No. Remember, Quite. because they'd have to be scared. They are scared. They're scared. Ah! Oh, no. Welcome to Grok Talk. After our week <laughs> off, see what happens to us. We take a week off, we go get some training, we come back, we're all punchy. <laughs> it's a little weird. Lots to talk about, but we're starting the show early this week because uh, our next guest, or our first guest, I should say, uh, wasn't going to be able to join us later, and we wanted to get him on the program to talk about Governor Maggie Hess's budget. Greg Moore, welcome to the show. And thank you, and thank you guys for uh, starting the show early. Uh, the uh, Hillsborough County Republican Committee was gracious enough to ask me to come to speak with them today about several issues going on in Washington and in Concord, and uh, I accepted, and then you guys called, and I said, ooh, Double book, but I really appreciate you guys moving up the start of the show. Well, so it's you, it, so you're the reason I had to get up even earlier on a Saturday, huh, Greg? No, it's the budget. The budget is the reason. <laughs> this is important stuff, Skip. It is. So let's talk about this important stuff. What? Okay. Well, I, I think that uh, I think that one of the, the things that happens quite a bit when it comes to budgets, just generally, and it's usually because the various groups that are trying to get more money, whether it be university system, uh, Medicaid providers, or what, or what have you, all make their case in, in the public before uh, the budget is released. One of the things that the media tend to look at is who got money and who didn't get money. And, and that's fine because, because, again, the squeaky wheel gets greased and those are the people making the noise. But I think it's important to realize that a budget is a set of priorities where you are taking money from taxpayers to give it to, give it to various programs. And I think that part of the problem is, is, that, is that when people focus on the budget, they, they, spend, they spend a lot more time worrying about where the money went as opposed to where it came from. Mm. And so one of the things that we like to do is try to shift that focus right back to where the money's coming from. And that's partly because, if you think about it, when people raise taxes, frequently everybody gets hit. But the people, when there are uh, program increases in spending, don't, those benefits don't usually accrue to everyone. They usually accrue to a small number of people. Um, and that's why those small number of people who, who stand to gain a lot of money make a lot of noise about it. But the people who, who have to pay the bills, uh, it's diffused and, and the, the actual hit tends to be a lot less. So, but, but, but that doesn't change the fact that this budget is one that, just to be, to be totally blunt, is a budget that it grows unsustainably. I think the finance chairman in the House, Neil Kirk, said it best. Unsustainable growth. And it relies on tax tax uh, tax increases that are unlikely to pass the legislature. I, I liken it a little bit to something we saw in Washington with the federal budget. Now, President Obama, as everybody knows, put forth a four trillion dollar budget, and for ten years it goes out. It increases taxes by two point one trillion dollars, adds eight and a half trillion dollars in additional debt, and spends money like crazy. And and no one thinks that that can actually happen. But the purpose of that particular purpose of that particular budget uh, was one that, that the president achieved, which is to bring his liberal supporters and his liberal base back together again. Because after a rough 2014, he needed something to bring his base back together, and he's been successful in that regard. And so, in many ways, I, I view Governor Hassan's budget is fairly similar. Give a little bit of money to a lot of the key special interest groups to hold her base together, even though she knows full well that the, the outcome of this budget is unlikely to be to be implemented and a lot of the programs are unlikely to actually happen but it keeps her 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 folks her core supporters happy and gives them something but for those of us on the other side on the other side of the equation the people actually have to pay the bills it's a lousy budget um right after a 23 percent gas tax increase last year we're now looking at 35 percent increase in motor vehicle fees obviously that's a huge hit for a lot of people and for those who remember what happened in 2009, just how incredibly unpopular those motor vehicle fee increases were. It was absolutely disastrous for Governor Lynch, and uh, ultimately that actually ended up going away. So I think that, that 
that's a very unpopular thing that she did that's going to hit drivers at a time when, look, the economy isn't great, but, uh, but it, it's a little bit better than it was in 2009, but people still aren't looking to, to write an, an additional check to the DMV every year. That's one important one that hits everyone. The, uh, the other important factors as far as increases in taxes, and, and we don't know all of them, because, and we won't know them until the governor actually delivers the budget to the legislature, which sometimes might happen as late as, as early March. It should happen sooner, though. Uh, a 21 cent per pack increase on, on cigarettes. Um, obviously, that makes us much less competitive as we uh, look at the cross-border sales and the benefit that has to our local economy, people coming to New Hampshire to buy cigarettes. So it hurts all across towns like Nashua, Salem, and, and even, along the, uh, even along the main border, places like Rochester and Portsmouth. So that's, that's, definitely, uh, that's definitely another factor. A new tax on e-cigarettes, that's a brand new tax that's being created. Uh, and it's funny because the governor said that one of the reasons why she wanted to increase taxes on cigarettes was to help people stop smoking, to help kids stop, stop smoking. But e-cigarettes are actually one tool that, that a lot of smokers are using to stop smoking cigarettes. So yet, yet she wants to tax those, too. So that's an interesting sort of uh, cognitive dissonance there. How do you, the um, I, that, that, these Democrats and their, their taxes, they... They, like cigarette taxes. I've written about this a ton of times. I, I know the statistics. I know the numbers. I know that the tax increase did not reduce teen smoking. I know it did affect cross-border sales. But, you know, this is – they want this money, and the, I'm like, your point in, in taxing cigarettes is to make the tax go away. So you rely more and more and more on the revenue. What do you do when it's gone? I mean, it, what, what do you do when it's gone? You, you tax food. You tax beverages. People consume less. What do you do when that money goes away? I mean, it's like, why do you pick these unstable taxes? Income taxes are unstable, for Christ's sake. Because they hate the Laffer curve. Yeah, well, they don't true. understand it. They hate well, it. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. You, you say, I want less of something, so I'm going to tax more of it, which does make strong economic sense. But then say, oh, I need the revenue to, 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 to increase spending. So you're right. There's, again, there's, that, that makes about as much sense as saying, as saying, well, I want to stop people from smoking, so I'm raising taxes. But then I'm going to start taxing a product that helps people stop smoking and eat cigarettes. <laughs> That's true. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and well, that, that makes it. 21 cents. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Greg. We need, a, we need a laugh track here with this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, Greg, what they, what, what they see is, oh, it delivers a, an addictive drug, nicotine. So we have to protect adults from themselves. Of course, of course, except except for alcohol, which we, we ask people to sell more of, and we put the stores right on the highway. New stores, and, new stores, and, and exactly. And the state and the state says, and the state says, come visit our liquor stores; they're the place to be. Um, no, but I, I think that the most pernicious tax though is is one that's that's, that's particularly uh, damaging to our economy in the long run, and that is uh, Governor Hassan, who some of, some might remember back in two thousand nine when she was a Senate Majority Leader was a strong proponent of the LLC tax. And I know you guys spent a lot of time focusing on the LLC tax back at the time because it's, because it's basically an income tax on small businesses. Well, let's just say that, let's just say that, that even though uh, it was an incredibly unpopular flop and the legislature had to move to get rid of it uh, almost immediately, uh, Governor Hassan went right back to that LLC tax in her budget. So clearly, clearly she really wants to put an income tax on small business owners across New Hampshire. Um, what she wants to do is undo some changes that were made in 2011 to protect small business owners from, uh, from, from the DRA and, and, and tons of audits, um, which, by the way, adds the compliance cost that, that damages the economy almost as much as the tax. And so she wants to get a $44 million tax increase on small businesses. And, uh, and, and, and her, that's her strategy in terms of uh, how she's going to raise money to, 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 in, a, in her budget. And then you look beyond that. She also wants to tax businesses that, uh, that that basically go overseas in an effort to try to uh, in, in an effort to try to um, evade some of the incredibly onerous federal tax code. Said, evade well, is tax such code. a pejorative term, don't you think? <laughs> well, I think it's I think it's a logical business decision that these companies make if they want to be competitive in a global marketplace and they're selling their goods across the globe. Then they're going to try to find a way to reduce their tax burden. Well, of so course, I, but I, evade. I, I wouldn't say evade. I'd say they're smart guys. No, I, I think that I think that, that it. it uh, but I think that you, you're right to a degree because evade makes it sound like they're doing something illegal. It's absolutely perfectly legal. Of and course it's, it and is. It's, 
something that every single CPA that they have in, in their uh, their organization says to do right away in terms of tax planning. So, yeah, I don't want to give the connotation that it's that's, uh, that that's a, that's a negative, but I will tell you that that's something that Governor Hassan base balances her budget on is those those new tax increases on those companies as well. Great. So we're taxing we're taxing companies, and and it's just uh, it obviously it's a huge negative uh, consequence to our economy. Greg, uh, this is Skip. Over and over and over again through the blogosphere, whenever we see an attempt to cut taxes, we see the liberal response is, well, that's going to be taking revenue away from government. And that's the exact phrase that they use. And it basically tells me they believe government has first right to that money. So when Hassan says they're evading the taxes, she's really using a short phrase to basically say – they're taking money away from us, and we should have it first, period. And it's always under that rubric of progressives believe in their heart of hearts. They know better how to spend our money than we do, right? And you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I've spoken on several, uh, several bills regarding taxation this year. And the first question, the first question that a lot of the folks will, on, on the left will ask is, how do you plan to pay for this tax cut? And I, I give the same answer uh, every single time. I say you don't pay for tax cuts. You, I said you budget for tax tax reduction. You know, it's a very simple thing. You you just re reassess your priorities within government and make that decision. So uh, that's obviously very not a popular answer among the people I give it to. <laughs> I bet you they don't even understand it, Greg. No, because because you're right. They view is they view the. Uh, government is having a property right to your tax revenue, and and that's obviously a, a huge issue that uh, that that separates them from uh, basically the, the vast majority of, of the citizens of, of of New Hampshire and the country. But when you look at when you look at all these tax and fee increases, that's how you get up to a budget that, at least based on the documents that the governor provided, um, says that the spending is going up by roughly $947 million, which would be a 9% increase in spending budget to budget. And i got to tell you what, I don't know too many people out there whose who's, uh, who's income has gone up 9%. So if the people aren't, aren't um, seeing their income go up by 9% and their government spending 9%, that means that people are paying more of their money uh, to, to pay for state government. And, that, and there's a real world uh, impact on that, on families, on children. And, and 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 it's unsustainable. Yeah, I, I, I loved I loved your comment, uh, Greg, about property right to our money. I, I thought that was a, a real top notch line. Back to Susan. I've, I've got a question, Greg. I I don't know who sponsored it, and I don't know the bill number, but because I kind of been focused on on other things uh, the last couple of weeks. But is there not a a bill that has either been introduced or about to be introduced that would Levy a one and a half percent BET on um, organizations that are classified as uh, tax exempt or or non profits. Well, is, well actually, let, let me let me ask you. Let, let me follow that up though. Um, when you when you look at the the tax returns and and the balance sheets and the income statements of some of these so called non profits. Um, the bulk of the money that gets laundered through these organizations goes primarily to payroll tax and benefits, to supporting salaries and benefits for their employees. There's, there's not money being spent on R&D or machinery or, you know, equipment, things like that. It's, it's on employees. So I'm wondering, um, everybody else, the BET is primarily a payroll tax, right? Correct. So these, these tax-exempt Organizations, these so-called nonprofits, are basically hiring people and getting out of. They are evading, if you will, the state payroll taxes. Is that a correct assessment? Yeah, well, I would say this. I mean, uh, historically, historically, nonprofits have been exempt from state from state taxation. And but I, I will say this. Uh, I mean, I know this for the prime sponsor, uh, Representative Hess from Hooksett, and um, his. Philosophy going in had more to do specifically with the hospitals, which in many cases he views as not truly nonprofit organizations, and uh, wanting them to put something in, considering that they that uh, 
that they are, they've been asking for, for uh, reductions in their Medicaid enhancement tax uh, expenditures. So, I mean, I, I, that's the genesis of, of it, and, and his philosophy was if you, if you extend that tax to nonprofits and you could reduce the overall tax burden for, for other businesses, at least he's not looking for it as a profit center. He's simply looking to basically broaden the base of the tax. And generally speaking, that's, that's not always a bad thing in terms of broadening the base of the tax and, and reducing the rate. I think that that's a fundamental precept of tax reform is to, to make sure everybody's paying in the lowest rate possible. Um, so I think that's, that's something that it, it's, it's an ongoing discussion in Congress uh, as to whether or not um, these, these uh, nonprofits should be subject to, to BET. And, and, uh, but it, because, I mean, at the federal level, at the federal level, nonprofits are subject uh, to, to FICA. So they still have to, their employees still have to pay the payroll tax on FICA. Um, so, I mean, that's the, the argument he's using. And that's, it's basically, like I said, it's a fundamental precept of, uh, fundamental precept of, of tax reform is broadening the base and lowering the rates. Well, David Hess um, is the same fellow who in 2000 um, gave political subdivision status to regional planning commissions without making them subject to uh, either state budget or finance laws like any other political subdivision, a town, a school district, or whatever. So these guys, um, these regional planning commissions, um, needed the political subdivision status and the ability to incur debt because nobody would give them money otherwise. Um, they were they were hand to mouth, um, year to year, trying to get money to impose their will on on localities. So in 2000, he sponsored the bill and got it passed. But when you look at, for example, the the regional planning commission in which uh, my town participates, the Central New Hampshire uh, Regional Planning Commission, more than 85 percent of the money that goes through that organization supports employees and their benefits. And they are allowed to kind of do whatever it is they want. Granted, they're paying a, a federal FICA, but why would they be able to escape, evade uh, Mrs. Hassan's tax net when, in fact, all they're doing is employing people? Well, uh, you know, again, that's, 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 just a, that's a fundamental policy issue that people have consistently held, which in terms of state and local taxes, nonprofits have been have been uh, able to avoid taxation uh, as well as at the federal level at, the, at obviously at the, at, the, at the federal level they avoid any of the, the corporate income taxes so I mean again it's, it's a policy discussion that's ongoing I know that, that representative Hess has put this bill forward for several years now um, it, it seems that it's, it hasn't gotten a lot of traction yet I'm not sure it's necessarily going to get uh, a lot more traction this time than perhaps in the past but, uh, but it's certainly, like I said, it's, it's an issue of, from a tax reform perspective that, that should be considered. It's no, there's no question that, that it, again, it's, it's a benefit. But just, just focusing back on, 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 the, um, on the budget, I think that one of the, the key things that, that you, you look at any budget, it's a list of priorities on the spending side. And on the spending side, one of the things that we've seen is uh, this, this governor who's absolutely committed, for example, in in uh, in bringing a rail system, which ultimately would be a, a long term taxpayer, taxpayer boondoggle for the to the citizens, and um, I think that said uh, that I think it was uh, uh, Drew Klein of the union leader said four million more dollars for studying rail again, um, and as a, and instead of giving it to the people on the developmental disabilities wait list, they simply get their wait list uh, renamed. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, she's mm-hmm. just she's just aping so, Thomas they, the Train, they, and she's saying, "I know I can, I know I can, they, I know I can." They didn't get money for the, they didn't get money to pay off the wait list, but they did get a new name. So I guess they have that. They got that, a new that, name. We changed so we changed the name of high school dropouts too, and that just disappeared. I wonder if that's the plan. Oh, it went from liberals to progressives to liberals back to progressives. Now they're pr- pragmatists. Yeah, but but look at look at pragmatist. John Lynch's. John Lynch's magic. I mean, he changed high school dropouts to early exit non-graduates, which the federal government doesn't track, and all of a sudden our dropout rate went down to 1%. It's magic. They could do the same thing with the Yay. developmental disabilities list. Maybe, maybe we need to rename the train is what you're saying. Yeah, that's what it is. We need to call it something else. We need to call it like a... Multi-wheeled transportation yeah, like conveyances. A, yes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think that one of the one, another one of the, the major concerns of, of the budget that we saw released on Thursday is something that we've been talking about uh, over the course of the last couple of years, which has, has to do with with Medicaid expansion. And obviously, 
uh, Governor Hassan makes Medicaid, Obamacare Medicare expansion permanent. Uh, at this point, uh, the program sunsets either at the end of this year or the end of next year, depending on whether the federal government gives the state uh, several Medicaid waivers. But the thing, the thing obviously is, is uh, and, and I wrote this in an op-ed earlier this week, and it really focuses on, on um, where we're setting our priorities as a state. Medicaid is already eating our state budget alive. I mean, our Medicaid program grew from, uh, from it, it just almost exponentially in the, in the matter of the last few years. But according to the National Association of State Budget Office, Officers, it grew from 24 to 27 percent just between 2012 and 2014. It's obviously coming along in, uh, of our total state budget, and it's coming along and taking away opportunities for, say, education or public safety or even getting access to the court system. I was talking to an attorney this week who said, if you want a jury trial in a civil case, you're waiting three years. Three years. And so we are, we are basically limiting people's access to justice to continue to pay for programs like Medicaid. Now, what's significant about Medicaid expansion under Obamacare is that in the fiscal committee uh, a little over two and a half weeks ago now, the fiscal committee, the, the fiscal committee actually voted uh, because of these cost overruns because of Obamacare, and in part because of Obamacare Medicaid expansion cost overruns, they actually had to go and transfer money from within the department, cutting other programs to pay for these services. So, so while Medicaid is actually actually eating the uh, state budget alive, Medicaid expansion, these new po- this new population, is taking away from other services for the, for the truly needy. And I point that out because according to the Urban Institute, uh, 82.4% of people who are going to be signing up for Medicaid expansion are able-bodied, childless adults. Now, if we're cutting if we're cutting services to the disabled, to seniors, for children, to provide a welfare benefit for able-bodied, childless adults, basically you have to ask yourself: What are your priorities? These are people who, in theory, we should be in, should be in the workforce, and and people who we need to get into the workforce. These are people who are on the sideline. We need to get them out of, frankly, in many cases, their parents' basement. Get them into the workforce and get them moving. The last thing they need is a disincentive to go and, and seek gainful employment by getting a welfare benefit uh, for for not working. And I think that fundamentally, that's a, a, a huge problem. It's an ongoing problem, and and it's even becoming worse as we're starting to see the impact it's having on other services for people who I think a lot of us would say are truly need people who are severely mentally ill, people who are developmentally disabled. There is a role. To try to, to try to provide services for those folks, but to take money from them to give that money to uh, able-bodied, childless adults is fundamentally it's, it's a huge public pro- po- public policy problem, and we're seeing it happen right now in Concord. Hey, Greg, uh, I was once told them votes don't buy themselves. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> well, I mean, let, let, me, let me put it to you this way. Um, the, the, the folks, the folks who, who fundamentally uh, were on on uh, now as subject to Medicaid expansion, a lot of those folks actually, some of them, a, a good chunk of them were, were signed up on the exchange, got heavily subsidized Obamacare policies through the exchange. Now, now just as a mental model, consider this for a second. They go to the exchange. If, let's say they're between 100 and 138 percent of FPL. And by the way, in order to get to 100 percent FPL, you need to work about 28 hours a week. At minimum wage, and so it's it's not even a full time job at minimum wage to get to 100 percent of the federal. You got, of the federal you got two federal. minutes to squeeze this in, so keep going. Okay, so so uh, if, if these folks went onto the exchange, they got a ninety six hundred dollar policy for which they are paying about you know two or two hundred fifty dollars a year once the, with the Obamacare subsidies, and now and now they're being shifted to a Medicaid program that's much lower quality. That's about a fifty five hundred dollars. So they lost about four thousand dollars in benefits by being shifted from uh, the Obamacare exchange onto Medicaid. And, uh, and, again, these are the types of issues that we're going to explore with the legislature as we work to try to, to uh, <laughs> get them to reverse the, the policy to, to make Medicaid expansion permanent. Greg, uh, we're coming to the end of the segment, and I want to thank you for taking some time to uh, talk to us about the budget. Um, how do people reach you guys at AFP New Hampshire? Uh, best way is to come to our website. It's uh, it's, it's long. It's uh, it's www.americansforprosperity.org, 
And then uh, you can come and, uh, and click the New Hampshire slider, and you can see what, what's going on here in New Hampshire. Or you can look nationally at what's going on in, in terms of uh, our activism on things like the Keystone Pipeline. All right. Great. Well, thanks so much. Uh, good luck at the Hillsborough Republican Committee today. All right. Thank you. Thank and, you, guys. And, this and is a good time. Stay warm. <laughs> Will do. All right. Take it easy. All right. Thanks to Greg. Um, it's uh, See, so those of you who are listening, you know, if you want to be on the program, and we're not against the idea of getting up and, and hauling our butts in here a couple minutes early. I mean, we usually start the pre-show at 830 anyway, so it's not like we can't come on the air and do guests, but we don't want to commit to that because then that means we're coming in even earlier every day to get ready for the show, and it's a pain in the butt. So, I doth protest what he said. What? I, I don't particularly like to get up even earlier. You, didn't, you are here, and we are ready to go live at 830 Almost every single week. What's the difference? Because I had to be ready the earlier. Pressure. It was mental pressure. It was entirely in your head. <laughs> well, you know, the the point was brought up about uh, why are we giving money for the the people who are workable and taking it away from those that are on that list for the mentally disabled. They just all seem to prescribe to that Ezekiel Emanuel's thought of worth to society sure. model, uh, mm-hmm. model, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is, you know, if, if you Them hit votes 70, don't buy themselves. Yeah. Well, or as he said, you shouldn't be getting much medical assistance at all when you hit 75. I expect to die at 75. I will reject it. Well, that's fine for you, but stop making decisions for me and stop making decisions, <laughs> adverse decisions. <laughs> I was wondering where that was coming from. For those people who really desperately need the help. Pressure. Pressure. Cool. I love that song. <laughs> One of the best. Nicely done. Nicely done. With the iPad and the microphone. And that sounded good. It did. It did. Yeah. I was going, you can it? Cue, I thought you know was what? you. This is your, you can cue up like sound bites while we're talking and we're <laughs> playing through your microphone. That's awesome. Save me the trouble of having to try to juggle all these uh, displays and screens and windows and all these other things that are going on here. All right, so uh, coming up, uh, we don't have Guy this week. He couldn't make it, so we'll just fill the first 15 minutes with whatever we want, and then we'll have Ron Moore on, our storm chaser, to talk about snowstorms, blizzards, and climate. Oh, um, my. That's, and, oh, my. <laughs> yep, that's all coming up. We have a, a, a week of storms on its way starting tomorrow. And So uh, what else is new? So what else is new? Uh, it's going to be fun. Lots of snow, lots of snow. The roof's getting... Snow's getting really high up there, so. Need a bigger snowblower. I I can't get my snowblower on my roof. That's so. I can. Yeah, you can. You can. I can. Wow. I don't even know. Maybe we'll have to talk about that in the next segment. All right. I have to put it next to the house, but we'll ah, be right. It's getting it up there in the first place. This is great. But I can. Stay tuned. New Hampshire is famous for scenic drives but they're tough to enjoy when you're on your way to the doctor. Because Obamacare limits your choices, some will have to drive more than an hour to see a doctor. What's health insurance worth if care isn't there when you need it? Gene Shaheen voted for Obamacare, putting your doctors and hospitals further out of reach. Tell Senator Shaheen, Obamacare is not working for New Hampshire. Jean Shaheen and her allies are making false claims about her record on veterans. The truth? Shaheen refused to meet with veterans pushing for reform. She wasn't on the committee that wrote the reform legislation and refused to co-sponsor important VA reforms in the VA Management Accountability Act until after the VA scandal broke. When our veterans needed her, Jean Shaheen was AWOL. Tell Jean Shaheen to stop distorting the truth and fix the VA. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Thank <laughs> you. 
Another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your fear, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Wait, if you missed it... Do it again. <laughs> Where is that the is the ring neck Hosmer Goose. <laughs> that is the ring. That's with a W-R-I-N-G. So, yes, uh, and it, it will be well rung, and uh, he will be cooked. Yeah. He is not happy. Senator Half-Baked. Senator Half-Baked Hosmer. Andrew Half-Baked Hosmer. You know, it just rolls off the tongue. It does, it does. doesn't it? It was he so probably just, sing-songy. He probably thought he was just denigrating some little woman or other. Well, interestingly enough, um, uh, the story... Uh, how, how could he possibly have known that, that, that he was dissing one of the premier gun rights activists in the state? Well, I, I wrote the same email to him that I sent to the other 23 senators, mm-hmm. even those that I knew that were in support of the bill. And the point that I was trying to make, not as, as a necessarily a, a, a gun rights activist, but basically... On, on a woman's rights um, side of it. And he, he had obviously, not that do you know who I am sort of thing, but, you know, I put under my name my, my town, which not in his district. And I don't know, maybe he just thought it was, was cute. He writes back, Susan, like he knows me. Um... Thanks for writing. Thanks for contacting me. But your points are, at best, half-baked. Uh, regards, Andrew. Okay. Lighting the fuse. Well, I, I, I got responses from some senators that were, you know, uh, you're not in my district, so thank you anyway. But And some went, are you kidding, Susan? You know how I stand on this bill, right? And then I got some absolutely no responses. I guess about half of them, quite frankly. I bet even some of the Republicans. Oh, yeah. But, you know, the, the, the good news is most of the Republicans I knew were in support. So I wasn't really bothered by that. No, but they all, I had they all not, voted for it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I had not been insulted by a New Hampshire senator in writing. Plenty yeah. of times in, 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 in person, but not in writing. And I thought, huh. Maybe he just, it's not, do you know who I am, but do you just really think women are stupid? And when when Steve came up with the half-baked um, bit, uh, half-baked Hosmer, I thought, well, maybe maybe there's something going on here. And I, uh, I wrote a little piece about it and put it on Facebook and also posted it up on Granite Grok. And... Um, we're raising money. Thank you, uh, Cinder Hosmer, <laughs> off of your insult uh, to send me to classes that will teach me how to be more articulate in presenting my arguments <laughs> and, uh, and baking them fully to where they are well done. And you, sir, will probably get served the first load. So uh, thank you for that. We, 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 we will try to, uh, to use your insults to their, to their best. But... Worse than the insults, okay, I, um, I was told by someone who saw him that same night, okay, after, after the vote on Thursday, that um, he said to this person, um, yeah, one of, one, of, one of your folks, one of the people that work for you, um, um, is, that, is that one of your folks? And, and the person said, uh, no, that person doesn't work for me. That's a friend of mine. And um, the person says, do you have any idea that she sort of 
is is one of a, a group of, of gun rights activists. Do you know what you have just done? <laughs> and um, he said, well, sh- she wouldn't shake my hand. Well, I saw him after the vote on Thursday, and he was walking out of his office, and I walked up to him, and I said, Senator, I said, my name is Susan Olson. And he shook out his hand, and I said, I'm not going to shake your hand. I said, you owe me an apology. And he looked at me <laughs> like I was, I don't know, uh, the gardener or, or, or the pool guy. Like, how dare you speak to me? And we know how pool guys get treated in this state. Mm. And, <laughs> and he walked away. Nice line. Well, what I, what I had done earlier that morning on my way into the state house was I dropped by his little office and dropped off a pint of Ben and Jerry's half-baked ice cream, and I take my business card to it. And I, and <laughs> the half-baked one, huh? The half-baked. And, and, I, and I go into his office. Of course, he's not there because it's very early, and I'm sure that, that you know, the, the maid hadn't gotten him up yet and off to work. So um, I said, may I leave this for the senator? And, and the staffer said, you're killing me here, Susan. The staffer knew me. And I said, well, can I, can I put it in the fridge? And the staffer said, well, sure. Would you believe that his refrigerator, even his refrigerator, opens from the left? <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, are you kidding me? Did you do this deliberately? He goes, Susan, you're killing me. Get out of here. <laughs> so in, in the fun article that Kitchy Kitch wrote... This would be Michael Kitchen, Michael Kitch, Tony yes, sir. Daily Sun, who yes. who is not exactly a fan of Granite Rock, but seemingly keeps reading it. Thank he, you, Mike. He, and he took you, the time to mention almost all of us by name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Susan, yes. Kimberly Morin, Steve, yeah, myself, and, yeah. and he included the half. And he probably would have mentioned Mike, but Mike's been away and he hasn't been able to write. <laughs> Mike's, well, Mike's been minding customers and babies. Well, that's frontline support people uh, continuously the last few weeks. By the way, slide over six inches that way. Well, oh, I, okay. I didn't leave Thank the you. ice cream on his desk. You put it in his fridge. I put it in his Which left-handed, opens from, the left. Right. opens from the left, fridge. Was it plain vanilla? No, it was half-baked. Whatever's in half-baked, I don't know what I don't is. know. What it, we can look it up. We can look it up. I'll do that. Um, and so someone, either. Probably nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, either the staffer did as the staffer said they would and would make sure that the senator got it. Or maybe somebody thought it was kind of funny and left it on his desk and ran out of the room. I don't know. But either way, Senator Halfback probably still has my business card, I hope, and my phone number. And I'm waiting for it to ring. Okay? That's a bit like Glenn Beck waiting for the Obama phone to ring? Yes. Yeah. Guess that big red one? Here's yeah. the... Um, I could get, I could get, could a, get a, a Hosmer phone. We could wait. Does it, Nick? You can use this as your ringtone. Let me go get it. Play it up really. Put up really loud. (laughs) And you'd know it was him. I wouldn't know it was him. (laughs) So, Senator, here I am. You've got my phone number. I'm willing to listen to you. But let me know. So, half baked, which you asked, is here's the here's the marketing blurb. Here's the marketing blurb. Uh, maybe I need music for this. Let me go look because this is. Oh, while you're searching for that, I will say that I did write him an email. Did you sent it to him? Yes. And unlike you, I am a constituent. I live in that district. Hmm. I have not heard back yet either. Well, I'm sure he's a busy guy. He's trying to imagine gooey fudge brownies and crumbly frozen chocolate chip cookie dough nestled in a creamy chocolate ice cream with a touch of vanilla. And you have Ben and Jerry's half-baked. I get the doughy bit. Yeah. Okay. The doughy bit. All right. Have you seen the guy? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So, Senator, call me. So so is he the Laconia Doughboy? The Laconia (laughs) Doughboy! I like it. But you know what's really funny? But he's only half baked. He's only half baked. But he's decided that, you know, because Bike Week, Laconia. Well, that's right. If he was fully cooked, he'd be fruitcake. That's right. (laughs) He's trying to get the state to issue a a commemorative license plate for Bike Week. Smoke and mirrors. Well, left hand, right hand. Well, interestingly enough, the people who ride motorcycles, like me uh, and my friends, um, who go to Bike Week tend occasionally to um, Shoot. carry firearms. All right, 
But Mr. Hosmer doesn't see. I wonder if he thinks bikers are suitable mm. or if he treats bikers like he treats little old ladies. So, Senator, I want you to picture this. A little old lady on a great big road king, okay, decked out in, in leather, armed. I want you to think about that and then call me. I could put that on you, a commemorative you, plate. You might be playing into his worst fantasies. I could be. <laughs> I could be. But he's willing to waste taxpayer dollars on a hearing to have motorcycle plates to make himself look good. Maybe his picture's going to be him. I don't know. I do not know. We could do. We could. We could make some calls. We know people. We could get a, a, a graphic of of the of the. Well, maybe it's a loon and not a duck, but the the ringneck Cosmer goose. We could. We could. We could cook that goose. We could. Yeah. So. He's, yeah, he's, we he's well to. beyond half baked already. Mm. Yeah, loons and lead, huh? Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> so call me, Senator. You know where to find me. That's right. You've got her card. Yeah, you have Assuming my card. Assuming you saved it. <laughs> well, I don't know. He might have opened that ice cream pretty quickly. Well, he has his figure to think about, right? Because he's got to keep that doughboy. Well, it's going. that prosperous thing. You know, it's that <laughs> yeah. prosperous thing. Being a former prosecutor and all. Did you know that? He was a prosecutor in Massachusetts. Why is he former? Did he come to New Hampshire to spread his Massachusetts values? No, or? now he sells used cars. Well, that fits. Well, that's, that's, that's a right lateral up. move. <laughs> yeah, that's right up there with being a, a prosecutor what? in Massachusetts. Where? That is. <laughs> yes, auto serve. Yes. Tilton. New Tilton. Hampshire. Well, I think, I think there are many, many dealerships. There actually. are. There are, but he's the general manager down the street from my hometown. Oh. Do you think that this publicity might cause AutoServe to have second thoughts? Or maybe second No, he's married or, into the family. Or maybe secondhand thoughts? Well, it, you know what I wanted <laughs> to think about, though, is when all of us disgruntled little old ladies, okay, go stand in front of, of his dealership and talk about the fact that he obviously doesn't think women should be able to defend themselves. Now, it may not bother him, but, you know, if, if this is his wife's business, she may not be happy about losing business. You should all dress up like Aunt B or a Granny from the Beverly Hillbillies. Ooh, Aunt B! <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Aunt B! But we have other stories that have not been brought to the floor about Mr. Hosmer. Maybe we should start using them. I think it's time to shake that tree and see what falls out. We're going to take let's, a... Let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's do a background. Call me, Senator. We, we, we have had a bunch of people whispering in our ear over the years. Osmer, 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 Osmer. See, this is why you treat people nicely, because you don't know what they have. It isn't even nicely. It's respectfully. I'm older than he is. Respect your elder senator. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to call Ron Moore, and we're going to talk about uh, a different kind of climate and uh, some upcoming <laughs> storms and a little weather. And you guys stick around. We'll be right back. This is Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. <laughs> Welcome back to Croc Talk. Thanks again to Greg Moore for coming on to talk about the pass and budget or the groundbreaking beginning of whatever will become pass and budget. Sorry. I'm turning Get everybody, that right you, you, you everybody else's microphones on and I'm turning mine off. So uh, we're going to change gears, different kind of climate. We were talking about gun rights and so on and so forth, but this is a new segment that we wanted to start uh, about climate and weather, and it's been a, it's a great time to have it because we're on this uh, pattern where we're getting storm after storm after storm, and we have a storm chaser with us who doesn't have to chase these storms because they're coming right to his front door. Rodmore, welcome to the program, sir. Thank you. Good to be with you guys. 
Good, great. So let's talk about the weather. What the heck? <laughs> well, this is called global warming, and that's what it does. It causes it to snow and get cold. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's amazing, and I know you guys know all these quotes because you, know, you have some great guys come on the show like uh, Dr. D and all the other, J.D. and all them. Uh, but, but it wasn't many years ago when they were saying the snow would cease to exist. Mm-hmm. You know, like in 2000, they had all these quotes coming out from the University of East Anglia saying it'd be a rare event. Children would be sledding anymore. We moved up here about 11 years ago to New England, and I've met so many people who told me a few years back we wouldn't see snow anymore. And I asked them what's going on now. Many of them are very environmentally conscious. Uh, I'll use that term. That's and, not snow. Uh, yeah, and, and they exactly they say, "Well, we we told you this would happen." I mean, this is personal relationships I had. That five years ago, they said we're never going to see it. They say, "Well, we kind of knew this would happen." I said, "You can't change your forecast in the middle," you know. So uh, yeah, it's it's definitely. And, and as far as the chase things go, uh, I may be here in town tonight. Um, I may actually be in Portland or Plymouth. I may be in Plymouth, Mass., or in Portland, Maine mm-hmm. uh, later this evening. So we may actually go after this guy. Ah. So the um, so let's talk about the pattern. I mean, people don't. I mean, you get the weather, you know, but they don't really talk a lot about what makes this chain of events occur. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it, is isn't part of it the Earth's orbit? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I, you know, it's funny, though, there really are a lot of different things. Like, recently, there was this thing about increased moisture. I don't know if you guys heard about that made the last storm so bad. We were talking about the moisture came in off the Cape. And the, the real reality is the only warm water that's really having an effect on the pattern would be in the North Pacific. And, again, that's not my specialty, per se, but, but that's pretty much common sense. That has an effect on it. But those things do that all the time. Your currents move back and forth. The Gulf Stream is permanent. It's been there forever. I mean, you know, the shipping routes, the whaling routes, they knew about it. And um, this last storm in particular that dropped three feet, uh, and I believe you found that actually on Weather Valley, we're actually talking about this, that it, it dropped less than an inch of moisture in Boston. Hmm. That's like the driest snow you can get. So it was not an increased moisture that made that storm stronger. It was the dynamics of the cold air coming in, which is going to make this one tonight and tomorrow really, really bad and dangerous, the cold air coming into it. Now, this is high winds. It's a real blizzard. It's a lot like a hurricane, yeah. right? It, it is. And that's the only reason. I mean, I'm looking... I was went to bed at one, got up at five, you know, checking these models out, looking over everything, and uh, just trying to get a good assessment. It's very hard to narrow down these bands. The, the guys who do this for a living are really doing a great job, really, in this instance, from the weather service all the way up to the private guys, because to pick out where the band's going to hit and who's going to be under it is really going to be tough. But you know, six to twelve isolated 18 inches with winds everybody even here in the merrimack valley the winds will be gusting probably to 40 and 50 by 9 a.m tomorrow and everybody knows that that's what the weather service is putting out that, that's that's bad when you got this powder on top of that probably six degrees uh you know, i used to live in northwest texas amarillo this is a great plains blizzard is what it is wonderful just and that's how snow comes to texas right straight down the middle wow. what's that that's how snow comes to texas straight down the middle that's right. Out of Canada, man, right down through the tail, got the, uh, the, the cow gates in the north country there. They come straight through. But this, and this is something that people are not used to again. You know, the, this type of dry snow on top of the mounds of snow that already exist. And, you know, and I'll say this, too, when it comes to the whole the climate change battle and what's going on, um, we chase storms. We've chased many hurricanes. I've chased tornadoes, like I said the last time, since the early 80s growing up in West Texas. The last three years have been dead. Very few tornadoes, very few hurricanes. Uh, when the climate change became the term rather than global warming, first thing they said were ramped up more intense storms. And we're not seeing that. You know, We're seeing a more glamorization of storms. When one hits, you know, obviously everybody in the world is there to see it make landfall like the Marines or something. But there's not more of them. It's not worse. <laughs> if they were, I'd be out there doing it right now. So, you know. We're bats in West Texas. Uh, all over, actually. Uh, Amarillo is a younger kid, and I graduated high school in Midland, uh, oh. the Bush country. Yeah. I'm a Dallas girl. Are you? I guess it's and and, and it's not Richardson, it's not Mesquite, it's not Garland, it's not Carrollton, it's Dallas, just so you know. I know. I know. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I, exactly. I, I lived there a while, too. I actually went to seminary there. Did you really? Yeah, some people call it cemetery, but I'm um, a... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Dallas, great yeah. city. Well, and I went to school in, in Stillwater, sort of. Yep. Grew up around some tornadoes, you know. <laughs> yes, you did. We yes, chased you did. it. We chased them, but we were mostly drunk on beer when we were doing it. 
And Pete's, so they look so they look really cool, didn't they? They looked really cool, man. <laughs> Summer school was so much fun. You just wait for the weather to turn and say somebody's got a truck, somebody gets a beer, somebody gets a pizza, and we go after them. It's funny when I grew up in Midland. We we actually uh, I took my high school friends out sometimes, and you know, we would pack out the ice chest and everything in the back and eat sandwiches. We watch these things just blow up. What they call the dry line. Back then, no one knew what that was. Now, today, that's kind of out there too. But it was, you know, it was fun days. Those are great days. Which, yeah, they, they really were. You know, I'm talking about this whole climate battle that's been going on with. Uh, I think I mentioned to one of you guys on on Facebook that we just issued an ebook. Oh, and, you did? Uh, yes, yes, you did. Yes, it's called Storm Warriors. So they can go to Amazon, look up Storm Warriors, saving a king. And it's for kids. It's written for kids. And what it does, we compare storms today, real chases we've been on, all the the names are made up to protect the survivors. That's the way we put it. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, and they go back in time and chase the storms of the past, real stories, and then they chase similar storms today in similar cities, and they do a comparison. And it's really done in a fun way. We think it's our first one, and we've already got one coming out for the 1821 hurricane. We're going to compare it to Superstorm Sandy. So this first one's already out there, and it's... Uh, the 36 Tupelo Tornado, Elvis Presley. Most people don't know he survived a twister as a one-year-old. Wow, I didn't know that. Well, it gets yep. a little bad weather every now and then. They do, and that's what this story is about. And like I said, if your viewers want to go out there and check that out, you know, they yep. do whatever. We, but we it, encourage that. We'll, we'll uh, link to it when we put it up. Um, so that they can have a look at that. That's a good deal. And uh, so anyway, um, you know, I think probably some of our listeners who are maybe more educated about climate and weather than the average person, but they'd still want to know, looking forward through February into March, and I haven't had a chance to go over to uh, listen to Joe Bastardi to get, get updated on where we're headed in the next couple of weeks, but uh, we have you on the program, so we'll ask you, what does it look like for the next uh, six, eight weeks uh, of winter, or the rest of the season? Is, right? is the groundhog not going to see shadow because he'll be buried? Yeah, you know, I hear the uh, Merrimack Police Department here in uh, New Hampshire, they put out a warrant. Do you hear about that? They put out yeah, a warrant. For yeah, we that. did. We yeah, did. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so they're fighting about the truth. No, they're all calling for it. The, and these long-term guys, like you said, the Stardy and the others are really, you know, they do a decent job at that stuff. Uh, six to eight weeks of, of tough time coming up. And the early April. Uh, in fact, most long-term guys that I keep up with and follow, because that tends to be more their specialty, uh, they're all like, February for sure, you know, we got a half month left there, into March, easily, and maybe into early April, which is good, we really, you know, I know people don't want more snow, but you do not want a rapid thaw here, you certainly don't want rainstorms to come in with 50 and 60 degree weather, because that would be, that'd be bad, real bad, so we're, we're looking at least, a, uh, hopefully a slow ease out of the thing, but you got at least six weeks to go, yeah, in fact, just looking at the models this morning, about 15 minutes before you guys got hold of me, uh, in fact, I was just here with my son Josh. I said, "Boy, we've got five more storms on the charts in the next twelve days. <laughs> five of them, and they're all one foot plus." Wow! Now that's models. You know, that's not that's not obviously. You know, model models are just a tool. But if what they're showing is any indication, you know, we're looking at a, we're looking at over a hundred inches this season, easy because we're now here in Merrimack approaching the eighty inch mark. Uh, let me ask you a question, yeah. and and and. Maybe I've just recently noticed it or what. Um, since when do snowstorms get a name and who's in charge of that every year? How do they pick those names like, I don't know, Hester or something? Who's, who's in charge of snowstorm names? I would venture Is that to say Al that, Roker? I, you know what? It could be Al. It could be him and Stephanie Abrams that got together and, and coined that up. I have a feeling Jim Cantore got behind that, too. No, just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that, though, because that has stirred up that stirred up a lot of, uh, we'll call it excitement in the weather community. You know, some people kind of took it took laughingly, and others really got really upset about it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting idea. And uh, uh, believe it or not, you might not know this, there are a few other people out there trying to do the same thing. I thought that's really going to be interesting when everybody's got four different names for the same storm and no one knows which way it's coming or going, you know? I call them all Senator Shaheen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there you this is destructive, destructive, hey, that destructive. should be Hosmer. Well, well, also because she's one of those ones who, back in 2008, when she was running for Senate, was talking about how we wouldn't have any snow and the ski yep. season and tourism in New Hampshire would be ruined and, yep. the, and the foliage would be ruined. We wouldn't have leaf peepers and the maple syrup season would be ruined. Yeah, and it yep. turned out the ski season's being ruined not by the weather, but by the Obamacare that she was the 60th vote for because the ski areas can't afford the health care for, you know, season-round yep. uh, operations. Or the power to win those, uh, those lifts. Mm. Isn't it amazing? I, I, I tell people, I say, you know, folks who have been pushing this myth, this lie, whatever you want to call it, 
betrayal, the American public, say global warming, man-made global warming, climate change, all their junk. Uh, I, I said some of these people really, I, said, I guess you got to be easy with this, but some of these people should be brought into court. They really should be. You, you, you can't just sling terms like that around, deface science, ruin the public, and hurt the people of the country, and, and be able to just walk away from it. You know what I mean? Follow the money. So, so yeah, what are you oh, charging absolutely. with being Democrats? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, good Lord, we, we charge people with all sorts of things today. It, it, it's like, you know, I, I know we have an electoral process where people can be voted in and out, but uh, it, it's sad. It's like you said, it's affecting a lot of companies and people. Somebody said the other day, Boston couldn't have prepared for this because they had no clue it was coming. Well, if, you, if you'd have gone, honestly, I'm not promoting them, but Weatherbell and other companies out there, there were some private groups doing a great job saying this was coming. They said this was coming this year. If you'd have followed them instead of your other sources, yes, you could have, you could have been ready for it. Hell, and, even, uh, the farm, we, even the Farmer's Almanac's more uh, more accurate than the oh, yeah. uh, climate change folks. Absolutely. Because all you do is climate change, you just keep going 20 years out. Every time you get to your benchmark and none of your forecasts came true, again, I keep it real simple when I'm talking to people. I said, you said there'd be no snow and more hurricanes and tornadoes. We have tons of snow and no hurricanes and tornadoes. <laughs> so your forecast is coming. They said, well, you know... Uh, no, you can't. But, do yeah, but it's all caused by the same thing, so you can't uh, you can't criticize them. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly right. And then there was another notion I heard, and I, this one I don't have the source for it, but that they had not included humidity or moisture in their models. That that's one thing they had left out. That's why they. Uh, 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 wait, 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 wait a minute. Uh, isn't it true that Roy Spencer and S. Fred Singer have been saying for years that it's the humidity cycle, the water vapor cycle, that is in fact uh, the the regulating factor, the negative feedback in the loop? Absolutely. And not only that, that's one of the three core tenets of meteorology. If you don't put that in your, in your formula, I don't know who's making all this stuff. Well, we do. They were making it up. Yeah, well, all, all, the, stuff <laughs> that comes, all the stuff that comes out of the sky is moisture one way or the other, uh, whether, right. it's, whether it's fog, rain, or snow. That's exactly right. Yeah, well, it, 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 it was a no-brainer. A sixth grader could have got it. Yeah. But I'm, I'm with you. It's, it, the, the thing, again, being you know, into science and things, it, it, that aspect bugs me to death. Because you're not only lying to people, you've also got this science going. This science is not true. You're not giving it, and, and the kids are being taught this stuff. And, and now that it gets dangerous, because this storm will be a very dangerous storm. You know, this one, this week. And by the way, I know you guys are already aware, Tuesday and Wednesday, they've probably got another foot coming. We won't have more than 36 hours between the beginning and end. Yeah, I heard that was coming, and we're coming to the end of our yeah. segment. Yeah, so. i got, I got to dig out my log pile twice just to make sure i got my emergency <laughs> heat ready to roll. There you go. <laughs> hey, can I give you one more floor to the Facebook, the storm warning on yep, Facebook? Yep, real quick. you got about free. 10 seconds. Hurry up. Everything there will update you. The storm warning on Facebook, and again, it's all storm warning. You know, meet the public. All right, and the book is Storm Chasers? Uh, storm Warriors, storm Saving Warriors. a King. All right. Well, Ron, thanks so much for being on the program. You guys have a great weekend. Enjoy the weather. Thank you. It's you the do. only weather That's you got, one. right? That's right. You got it, man. You nailed it. That's a good phrase. I like that. Yeah, Joe Bastardi. <laughs> right. I don't mind if I steal it. All right, we'll see you. Bye. All right, bye-bye. All right, Ron Moore, we'll be right back with Ed Nail to talk about interstate vote fraud. Stay tuned. When asked whether she still supports Obamacare, Senator Jean Shaheen said... Yes, I do continue to support the law. We're beginning to see some positive results. How can Senator Shaheen say we're seeing positive results when 22,000 of our neighbors have already lost their health insurance? What's worse, the Boston Globe reports the state's only health insurance provider radically reduced the number of hospitals in their network, forcing some people to drive over an hour for lab work, even when there's a hospital within a few miles of their home. When pressed about lack of access, Shaheen said, There are some hospitals that are not covered, unfortunately, and um, I, I certainly hope that's going to change. Jean Shaheen promised us we could keep our doctors and our health care coverage. Now she hopes we can get to a local hospital? Call Senator Shaheen at 603-647-7500. Tell her we need more than hope. We need leadership. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning. The Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. 
This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning. You're listening to Grok Talk. Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your fear, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. All right, thanks to Greg Moore for coming in uh, at 8.30 to talk to us about the budget. Ron Moore for coming to talk to us uh, on the phone about weather. And uh, we're going to be moving on with Ed Nail in a second to talk about some interstate climate activity of the vote fraud variety. And uh, it's it's always good to get an update because so many things go on that we can't squeeze into two hours every week, which is why we went to two and a half hours this week. But uh, this is Grok Talk, brought to you by GraniteGrok.com, New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, and the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers, who is responsible for allowing us to use this space to have this broadcast every week, except for last week. So uh, let's move on with the chairman of the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers, we got some press this week. Yeah, I was misquoted. And, uh, uh, and misquoted, and they got the, the name of your organization, organization wrong. Yeah. You know when you have a teenager leaning over, over you with a notepad, uh, you, there's going to be trouble. You're the correlation of New Hampshire what? Yeah, <laughs> constipation or something like that. I'm not sure Constipation what of New Hampshire taxpayers. Uh, that actually works. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, we're trying to constipate some other people. But, That's right. Uh, Don't. Uh, uh, you got some well. vote fraud news for us. Yeah, let's do, uh, let's do uh, somebody from Pennsylvania that votes here. Her name is uh, Jenna Rakovan, and Jenna Rakovan, J-E-N-N-A-R-A-C-K-O-V-A-N. She's the only Jenna Rakovan in America. That's a tough thing to do when you're Ooh. trying to vote in two states. Mm. So here's her, uh, here's her background. I, I don't, you don't do well with photocopies at a, on a radio program, but what we have is a young lady who has, uh, appears to have voted in Dover, and uh, here's my list of the first 50 of the uh, people sent to me by Dave Scott in Dover who mailed everybody. Right. From who the voted last time you were on, he, he had a list. Yeah. The very ran. first guy was Robert Baker. And Robert Baker is Robert D. Baker of Lower East 19. That's his address. And the post office sent it back saying it is unable to forward. There's a different categories uh, for people in Dover that who, who vote there but apparently don't live there. Uh, unable to forward, no such number, no such street, attempted, not known, moved, left, no address, and insufficient address. So one of those six things is why your letter is returned once it's been mailed to somebody on the checklist. So we have like 1,500 of these to go through. Caught the very first guy. I have a bunch of these highlighted. The rack, Jen Arakavan's about maybe tw- uh, 15 or so down, 15 or 18 down. Jen Arakavan works for Rutgers University on Mystic Island in New Jersey near Egg Harbor. And I believe she lives in a dorm there that the facility has at Rutgers a University. college student. No, no, no. She's <gasps> 29 years old. So, in a dorm. Uh, in a well, dorm. That, well, it's well, a dormitory. That, well, let's, not a squir- let's not squirrel it too much yet. Let's uh, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> she uh, lives in a dorm that's supplied for this marine biology base that Rutgers has on the New Jersey coast. Okay. But she is a registered active voter in the town of Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. So I have her records from there. These are screenshots from her, from the, from the Pennsylvania database. Jenna Rakavan, 329-1985, age 29, female. Uh, she lives, her parents live at 70 Baybury Lane, Phoenixville, PA. And she has been voting there since uh, she first uh, started voting in 2000. I don't know, it was 2008 anyway, we have a a vote. 2008, she voted by absentee, according to the uh, Pennsylvania's database. You see the little envelope Mm -hmm. there. So she did the right thing. In 2008, but I don't know whether she voted here in 2008. In 2008, 
She was a UNH college student. That's so she her did the right thing. I don't know whether she voted here in 2008 ah. as well. Oh, as well. There's as well. the link. The so link New Hampshire has sloppy records. I can't just go get records from New Hampshire. So in Pennsylvania, I can. So what I do is I oh, mail wait. off. And even if you get records, if they're bad, they're probably wrong because that's what the AG will say. Yeah, I, uh, I caught a guy named uh, Jared Stephen Cram, and within days of announcing his name on Gerard at Large, the Secretary of State's office was conducting their own investigation as to whether or not he voted here in 2008, and they found out he didn't. They're tracking. So the records of... Stephen Jared Stephen Cram for 2008 show that he didn't vote in 2008. I have his complete uh, day, uh, record from Pennsylvania going back to 1998. And uh, New Hampshire says, oh, it was, must have been one big mistake. He didn't vote here. Well, he didn't vote there either. So here's a political activist that works for, for campaigns, mm-hmm. is the treasurer for somebody running for city council in Philadelphia, is part of the Philadelphia Democrat machine and didn't vote in 2008. He was training poll watchers in 2008. I know that from, from the internet. But New Hampshire says, oh, our, our internal investigation, which I haven't seen, says he didn't vote here. That's a great big eraser. Now, that couldn't happen. <laughs> yeah. That couldn't happen in 2012 when he voted in the Wilton because he wrote a 300-word essay about it and put it on the Daily Coast. Okay. Now, back to Jenna Rakovan. Jenna Rakovan, her name comes up on the list. So my obligation is when Dave sends me 50 names, I go down through the names. I have some highlighted. I, I got about uh, a third of these are voters in other states. I guess, um, well, I, I can't give the names out now, but the second guy on the list I have is being in Maine. Uh, a couple others. I got one in Dover, Delaware. Votes in Dover, New Hampshire, but she lives in Dover, Delaware. That all, of her, all of her data comes back there. And, you, you know, you find these... She's Interesting in the right names. Name city. Come you know, like, on. Like Jenna Jenna Rakavan is one of a kind. So I go through those names first. Robert Baker was hard to catch. Once mm-hmm. I had the middle name and I had his birth date, then all of his other addresses in Dover line up. His two phone numbers with a uh, 603 area code and a Florida area code match up. So when you do those numbers, it comes up Robert D. Baker. So I, I have him now. He voted in Florida, according to Florida's records, and he voted here, according to our records. So now I turn him into Florida, which I've done, and they'll, deci- they'll decide if he really does live in Florida, in Parkland, Florida, he'll get a, a letter from the elections board down there <coughs> saying, could you tell us, you know, where you're voting? They can instantly go see what, where his driver's license is, is uh, located. Does he have a Florida license or a New Hampshire license? So back to Jenna Rakovan. 29 years old, so she's been a UNH student. So I imagine she's been indoctrinated to how things work here. I'm having trouble understanding why Jenna Rakovan, uh, who is street name, St. John 2C, apartment 2C, or 2C address in uh, St. John, which the post office says is number two, that is no such number. So if you have a driver's license in New Hampshire, and this is your address, how does that work? Uh-oh. Did you give a bad address to, to, Pennsylvania, to New Hampshire for your driver's license? Or is your driver's license at 70 Baybury Road in Phoenixville, PA, 19460? I remember that zip code because that's where I used to live in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. <laughs> I know where her house is. And if Jenna listens to this, I can tell her, Jenna... I used to eat at the G-Lodge across the street from your parents' house. So uh, <laughs> that'll be a little creepy, the hair in the back of the neck will stand up. So what I've done is i got a Chester County Voter Services envelope, and I mailed this off. And this is the application. This is why this takes so long. If you're wondering why you, you can't just catch these people, you have to fill out these forms and request the data like I did with um, Jared Stephen Cram. And then I have a little note here. Oh, by the way, she votes in New Hampshire as well. And then I'll contact them after they send me this stuff. So I send this out. I get back everything I can possibly get on Jenna. And then we go on the radio and and probably tweet her or email her and say, hey, would you like to respond? So her response is going to be, I'm the only Jenna Rakovan in, New Ham- in America. Hmm. Someone voted by my name. In New Hampshire, maybe that happened. Somebody just thought up the name Jenna oh, yeah, Rakovan. we've heard that one before. Yeah, we'll we? just, I'll just vote here and I'll use the name Jenna Rakovan. I'll use, yeah, that'll work. So were you somewhere else, Jenna? Because once we go public with you, you can you have some explaining to do. 
Well, you said that as soon as you went after G- Gerald Cram, you heard from the AG's office yeah. indirectly. Se- Secretary of State's office. Yeah, so now are you going to hear from them again? Because obviously they're tracking you. Yeah, what I'll do is what I did in the case of Jared Cram, I did a right to know request to the Secretary of State's office, and I said, can I have all correspondence between October 10th and October 21st? regarding the town of Wilton where he voted and they sent me like six pages of stuff so I have that so they may be smart enough not to do that again because that builds my case what in the world weeks before the election here in New Hampshire is the Secretary of State's office doing an internal investigation into Jared Cram because I said his name over Rich Gerard's radio program in Manchester aren't we busy over there before an election we have time to look up and make sure that Jared doesn't get in trouble so in any case, Jared's in trouble. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. This one's... This not one. here. And, not here, but in Pennsylvania, right? And why would right? that be? Well, I turned him over to some authorities in Pennsylvania. So this one's confidential. I'll just pass it around, and you guys can go, ooh, ah. And I think the viewers and readers, uh, listeners, will, uh, will understand. Uh, so what we do is, in New Hampshire, I can't get information on a voter, even though the voters voted. They don't receive mail a couple of weeks after the election. We don't keep enough information on them, like birth dates and where they last voted and real addresses. You can vote, apparently you could vote with a phony address or a made-up address or insufficient address or no such street. You can just walk in and make up a street. As long as you have a driver's license from any state, you can vote in New Hampshire. So I've abandoned that effort. The heck with New Hampshire. I go to the other state. Now, Susan, in other states, they seem to care whether or not somebody votes in there in uh, Pennsylvania and in New Hampshire because sometimes you belong to associations that might be interested in that. So we go wherever wherever the path will lead to correct the situation. So we after we we're finished with Jared Stephen Cram and Jenna, maybe Jenna can respond to Pennsylvania authorities and I'll get a copy of that. And she can easily explain why there's maybe she has a twin sister with the exact same name or that there was nowhere else for her to vote so she went to an anonymous address in dover and voted there i like the the top of uh, what it says here on this yeah you can't i'm not gonna that. read it yeah, i'm okay. not gonna read it but it might jeopardize my hearing but this is a big deal yeah it's a big deal so <sighs> mr. Yeah, mr cram is uh, not like most of the voters so he's our they'll eventually be a spot on the wall here for a a, a trophy you know, like a head on a board shaped like a uh, cramp. <laughs> See, all, we'll now, all we need head. is to get a scan of his head. We'll get somebody with a 3D printer, and we literally could make a trophy yeah. head for his you. His picture's on the front page of uh, CNHT's website. Jenna will go up shortly. Uh, if you look her up on the Internet, you'll see there's pictures of her in there holding fish and whatnot. She's uh, holding all well, kinds she's of records and things for a uh, biologist, too. so that's what she does. Travels could, around. Could we call this a cram down, or should we hold that statement for uh, a couple? Well, of weeks? hang on. We've had a lot of fun with Jared because he responded to a tweet that Rich Gerard sent him, like that day. I can't believe he did it. Uh, he's apparently, not very smart for being a member of Mensa. But that's uh, Jenna Rakovan, uh, J E N N A R A C K O V A N. Jenna Rakovan of 70 Baybury Drive, Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. 19460 is voting in New Hampshire from an address that does not exist, according to the post office, and two mailings. So I'll get back to Dave. I'll get a copy of the envelopes that were sent back, saying no such address or no such um, street. Well, it seems to me there's an open uh, there's an open opportunity here in this uh, case because she lives in Pennsylvania, or her parents do. So that's she, where she votes from. She has an anchor address. Yep. She's voted in New Hampshire, but she's located at Rutgers. Correct. So anybody want to bet whether she's voted at Rutgers? Already checked. She's not listed in New Jersey's database. So wow. we caught three first before. We caught people registered in three states and, and D.C. Had to Who ask. have also answered tweets from the Gerard Show. <laughs> <laughs> you got to wonder. So maybe Jenna, we have her, uh, some email for her. We'll send her an email and, and see if she can straighten this out. I know New Hampshire's not interested. No, not at all. So why would they care if I do it? Yeah, it seems I'm to me. I'm not charging them anything. I'm doing this for free, right? Seems the to me. public service. We could drop a couple of hints and have the uh, Nash, the New Hampshire um, um, secretary. Uh, Oh, Bill Gardner? Sec- Secretary of State. Yeah. Uh, follow, follow up on false leads and just see how... That's what I'm, I'm looking for. See, I'm basically 
You could make the argument that I'm intimidating, Jenna. You? Right. Voter really? intimidation is a crime. So I would be interested in having a visit from somebody, some authority. And then we could play this out in a courtroom somewhere. And I could prove whether or not I'm right, or Jen is right, or Stephen Jared Cram is right, Jared Stephen Cram, or Robert D. Baker is right, or Caitlin Ann Lagaki is right. Tell me something. Smile, please. Does that look like an intimidating face? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, apparently it was you know the, several times because it's been punched. I've had twelve uh, stitches uh, in this thing. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, as as has been quoted from somewhere in uh, in the Florida bunker. He's just a harmless, lovable little <laughs> fuzzball. fuzzball. <laughs> we, so, that's, uh, so that's how you track voter fraud. And here's the other thing that, that why I go on the radio and I do workshops. We need tips. Jared came from a tip of somebody who went to one of my workshops. So they knew what to look for, and they handed us like a tuna. You know, here you are. <laughs> so, I mean, this guy is, we tracked him. We got everything on him. So it's, it's a, a wonderful catch. It's always encouraging to go back to Jared, and Jared has a future with us, as you can see from the letter. <laughs> Either way, he's Well, we can in. explore that future shortly. We're going to take 60 seconds, and we'll be right back. Stay tuned. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. Welcome back. We're talking about vote fraud. Honky tonk. Honky tonk vote fraud. You know, I was thinking it's really, it's got to be pretty hard to prove uh, vote suppression because you know, all you really need is an envelope and a stamp and uh, an absentee ballot from any place, really. Mm-hmm. And then you could vote just like you thought you lived in New Hampshire because they do that here all the time. They yeah. vote absentee here from wherever the heck they are in the world and, and they claim to vote absentee from addresses in our state. So... I mean, if that's the case, then what's the big deal? This person clearly is allowed to vote from anywhere they want. How could I possibly suppress their vote? Yeah, it wasn't suppressed up to this point. Nope. But, uh, I'm going to pick somebody. I'm not sure whether it's going to be uh, Jared or not. If we resolved, if, if Pennsylvania resolves Jared's issue to my satisfaction, we'll just use him as an example. Oh, it's an excellent example, too, because, yeah. I mean, we got if you say, ways. all you have to do is say to people, look, Nobody in the state, in this state, is going to punish you for for being registered and voting in two states. But that doesn't mean your home state won't punish you, which is exactly what you're doing. We've been saying that since 2000. Yeah. Or so social now, media. Now we're starting to, yeah, we're starting to, yeah, it's, look up Caitlin Ann Lagaki sometime or Janice Rotman, uh, Rottenberg. Rottenberg. Janice Rottenberg. Rottenberg. Yeah. It's, hi, I'm Janice Rottenberg on Google, and the next 15 articles are low-life vote thieves. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, so go try and get a job someplace, other than a campaign. Campaigns would love you. Oh, yeah. I you'd know be one guy we caught was um, plaque on the wall. Uh, Jeff Wotrowski. He's got himself a really good job with the FLCIO. So they're looking for people like that, apparently. That, uh, well, crooks. Vote mobile yeah, they yeah, crooks. Yeah, yeah, they know how to do vote for Right them. to the top. So right. what we're doing now is... Uh, Following up on what Dave Scott has done in Dover, and that is uh, by simply mailing people who voted letters, getting those letters back and saying, let's do it again. We let, send them another letter, and you have those two facts in your hand. You have their name on the checklist, and all I need to prove that somebody voted in New Hampshire is that their name is checked off the checklist. I don't have to show it was that person because that's a public document. So if I say, you know, Jared Stephen Cram, is on that checklist, I'm good to go. No one can say, oh, you're just making this up, or this is personal, or you can't prove it. All I have to do is say, there we go. That vote was eliminated. Someone else's vote was eliminated because that name was checked off. That's all I have to prove. So I've gone that step. We have the, we have the list of who voted. And um, 
then I go to the internet and say, wow, look at this. I found your name, your same middle, it's Jenna L. Rakavan. Got your middle initial, I got your birth date in another state. Now you've got some explaining to do. Not to New Hampshire, but the state you're from. Pennsylvania's interesting, and I like catching people from Pennsylvania because Title 25 is their election law. Title 25, 1302B. When one enters another state and vote in that votes in any of that state's elections, you lose your residency in the Commonwealth. So Which would also mean your driver's, driver's license, license would be revoked. When you go back to vote again, they say, "Well, you've been removed, or you've gotten. You're going to get a letter from the state saying you're you're gone." So that's and other states have different statutes as well. Um, North Carolina the same way. If you vote, I believe North Carolina is one of the eight or so, if you vote in another state, you lose your residency. In some states, residency is very important for getting driver's license to anything. So it's a, it's a mark on your record. It's going to be on the Internet because we have enough Internet impact that whatever any of us write is on there the next within minutes. You can pull it up, and it doesn't go away for a long time. So that's our, that's our method for catching them. Thank you very much for the state of New Hampshire for absolutely no help and actually being a stumbling block. Uh, Bill Gardner was re-elected, re-appointed, re-anointed as uh, Secretary of State again. Secretary that, of State for life. For life. Uh, <laughs> well, why, why wouldn't he be? There's been a succession of Democrat governors or... or uh... Well, there, he's elected by the House, I believe. He's never had another job. He's never had another job, and he's also double, uh, he's a double dipper. That's all I know Sorry, how to do. <laughs> he's, I think he should retire. Uh, he had a golden opportunity to not run again, so... If this blows up in everybody's face, that's the face everybody's going to look at. Well, qu- question. You know, you've, we've made the statement before that if you're looking for normal work outside of politics, this is going to haunt you. Mm-hmm. And you just said, you know, but, but, you know, campaigns are looking for this. Is it really the case? And I'll say on both sides of the aisle where okay. if you are a very good picture, say, to use a Major League Baseball analogy here, you're known for throwing spitballs and bean, beaning people and stuff, but if you put up lots of W's, they're going to hire you and pay you well anyways. Is, is that what we're seeing with oh, Gary at, Cram and some of these other folks? Yeah, look at the, um, not particularly voting, but the two young ladies who used to work for Senator Schumer that got caught going into the uh, credit card history of somebody, uh, Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. Remember that? Those guys... And they've had a nice little career for themselves doing stuff like that, getting access to stuff. What, what are they buying with their credit card? You know, what movies do they rent? That kind of stuff to use in, in campaigns. So what, do they go after Michael Steele? Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I can see that. And we know that Jeff Wotrowski's done pretty well for himself. He's gotten himself out of North Dakota. And he has a nice job and a new, a new husband <laughs> down in D.C. He works down there. I don't, on the Republican side, I find a random... You know, we get registered Republicans that we catch uh, in two states. I'm working on a couple of those. But it's college students usually. And you never know whether somebody's registered as a Republican or a Democrat for some other nefarious reason, too. Oh, that's true. You know, some people are tactical, you know, party members. Like, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> Been a Democrat since 2005. So you never know. So what I do is I don't really care what party. If I see your name on two checklists, I see your name in two states or three states or four states, well, then you go to the top of our list. Yeah, it, and, uh, it, I just look at this and kind of keep thinking, especially with all the stuff going on, like uh, uh, as I sent out a couple of links last night to our internal uh, Grok crew list, you know, with Obama's amnesty, it's now turning out they're going to get um, – Worker registration cards, the green, sure. the green, the workers' permits. They're They'll going work to on be. Campaigns too. They're going to be able to get the driver's licenses. Yep. They're basically going to get all of the documentation uh, and, and, and that, income tra- tax credits. Oh yeah, yeah I was going to mention tax. that. Um, but they're getting everything that the normal person at the the voting hall yep. is going to say. Are you a U.S. citizen? Because you're not supposed to have a driver's They'll license say, unless. They'll say C. So, yeah. So basically. For all these little cases that you're going after now, they're they're thinking five to ten million illegal aliens will now be able to vote as U.S. citizens. Right. And I'm back to the statement of 
that what's the use of being a U.S. citizen if anybody can vote? Our last yeah, uh, uh, right. We, and, and we, and we are honest enough not to vote because we know that simply having a green card does not, in fact, entitle us. It I'd is, catch you it, the next day. It, it, oh. it, 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 it entitles me to pay taxes. Gee, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, it allows me to participate in campaigns and donate, but it does not permit me to vote. You know, well, when you the, look at when you look at all these people that are moving in. Don't think for a nanosecond that Obama's crowd doesn't know who they are, where they're going to live. They'll be in contact with community organizers. They'll work on campaigns. Oh, they'll yeah. vote. They'll move here and, and there to vote. That's, that's well, they, how this they, works. They, 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 they may even be located strategically in, in, in yep. uh, districts they want to tip. Yep. We actually have some uh, some leads in uh, Manchester in, in areas where we would find people who probably are in that category. So I have some... I'll help you when you're ready to do it out of uh, Manchester and Nashua. So that's right. my next move. I'm going to kind of take the tack of somebody who's a good citizen but looks at all this stuff going on and saying the Repu- the Democrats are all in favor of this. Mm-hmm. They're, they're playing not so much we're trying to protect Congress, which we're elected to. We're not protecting the uh, uh, and adhering to their oath to protect the Constitution. They're protecting Obama. They're very open about it. They're protecting their ideology. A lot of good citizens who aren't as involved as we are saying, what's the sense of even trying anymore? I mean, it is rather disheartening that these guys can vote. They're going to get all the entitlements that I have to pay for that they shouldn't be. You know, they just keep going down the list mm-hmm. and it gets longer and longer and longer. It's like, what is this? Co- why am oh, I fighting? We'll have a tipping point. Yeah. And, and the question is, how soon Doesn't is bother that? me at all. I, I mean, I... Treading water is no fun. I'd rather land on the beach and have it over with. So uh, if we get to a tipping point, we have remedies in our Constitution for that as well. We have a Second Amendment. We have uh, plenty of opportunities in the states, 50 states, to protect the states from the federal government. So it's that's where it's headed. Well, I mean, if you look well, the right- pro- well, well, wait a minute, though. But there's they're now pushing that the federal law trumps the state law. We're so- seeing in state after state where the state said we're allowed. not going to give illegals a driver's license, and now the federal law is forcing them to do that. Well, so what the, is the remedy? The remedy is the remedy is for the states to say, hell no, say no. you can't make it. But us. they're not. Well, they are in Alabama right now with the homosexual marriage deal. Yeah, Some of the but, judges are saying, you didn't win in all 50, all 50 of our counties. So you haven't won. Yeah. So it's, it's gradual. The gradual effort to uh, make us into a socialist that, utopia is yeah. slow. And, and there is, it'll be, there'll be one incident that flips this. There'll be some impact on the American psyche where something happens and they go, that's it, that's enough. Isn't, isn't that Roy Moore saying, so sue me again down in Alabama? Yeah. He, yeah. He's, he's a fabulous guy. There's but a he, got on, uh, he got on the news with uh, Chris Cuomo yes, and said our I rights have... don't come from God. Those little things where you get a good look at your opponent, your political opponent, and then he's talking heads that run the news, you say, that guy, why is he even there? Okay, let's so that's be... That's the trigger. Let's be careful because that's something I want to bring up because Steve had put up a post talking... Directly to that. We're out of time. Mm-hmm. We're out of time. Dang. Next well, segment. Josh is running a couple minutes late, so we can we can pick it back up on the other side of the end of the segment, and then vo- uh, he'll be here to talk about my voter fraud stuff's done though. Okay, we got that in. so we can talk about that when we come back on Grog Talk. Senator Jean Shaheen said, if you like your current health plan, you can keep it. That's not true, Senator. 22,000 New Hampshire citizens have been kicked off their insurance plans. Hospitals in Rochester, Concord, and Portsmouth, they aren't allowed to provide care under the exchange. Senator, you were wrong in your comments. You should apologize for your misleading remarks. I'm calling Senator Shaheen at 750-3004 and telling her I want my doctor back. You should, too. Paid for by SaberPack.org. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate committee. We are struggling. Rising health care costs are part of the problem. Senator Jean Shaheen helped create this mess we're in. As a state senator, her bill chased 21 insurers out of our state. It reduced our choices, raised prices for New Hampshire families. And when Jean Shaheen supported Obamacare, it limited access to 10 of our 26 hospitals, reducing our choices again. Tell Jean Shaheen she's made health care worse. Few things are as important as finding the right doctor. And under Obamacare, 
that's harder than ever. Over a third of our hospitals no longer available. Our doctors no longer covered. Fewer choices, longer drives. No state has been harder hit than us. And even after watching it impact New Hampshire, Congresswoman Ann Custer still supports it. Call Ann Custer. Tell her Obamacare isn't working for New Hampshire. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. All right, we are Grok Talk, brought to you by GraniteGrok.com and the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. Beautiful Concord, New Hampshire. Cold, we have a blizzard slash hurricane coming, a, a winter hurricane, also known as a blizzard. Named, is it named something? Did we talk about the name? Ever? Who is it? Oh, Hosmer. Hosmer. <laughs> Hosmer. Oh, yeah, we're going to have to do the Hosmer thing. Josh should be here in the next few minutes. He did say he was coming, so you can sit until he gets here if you want. You know, and we can talk about Hurricane Hosmer. So, uh... Is it going to be a snow job? Is it going to be a snow job? Oh, I could turn that headset off because it's not on your head yet, and it'd make all kinds of noise when you're moving it around. Anyway, uh, it is cold. Um, it is wintry. It, it, it will continue for at least another six weeks. So, you know, so uh... Also Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. It's Valentine's Day. Well, you know, we were talking after the show, we go get hot dogs sometimes. And, and uh, that's not happening because I, for example, have to rush home so I can go to lunch with my wife because we can't go to dinner because we don't know what the weather's going to be like. Yeah, we came down yesterday and, from uh, from the mountain and we had our Valentine's lunch yesterday. So did we. Yeah. Huh. Where'd huh. you go? Uh, Olive Mike, Garden. Mike brought Mama here. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I got I got home just after midnight, and Mama did me the the favor of picking me up from the airport. That's tough. Uh, and then you're uh, here in the morning, right? No, yeah, win, 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 winter is for lovers. With lovers, we're going to get home, dig out the log pile from the snow that's already on it <laughs> from last week, and get plenty of logs in the house so that we can have a nice so roaring warm. log fire for that's this nice. evening. That's very nice. Well, nice. While it's flaky outside. While it's yeah. flaky outside. <laughs> well, at the end of last segment, I would. Um, Mike brought up uh, Chris. No, was it one of these two? Either, Mike either or you Ed. Or, Ed. or or Ed uh, brought up Chris Cuomo, and yeah, oh, he that. was he was talking with um, the judge out of Alabama, saying uh, you know, and the judge is going on, and Ed left it sort of like the judge was saying that our rights come from men, and that was not quite right. Although that is, I think, the important part that was said by Chris Cuomo. Uh, offspring of former Mario Cuomo and brother of current Andrew former Cuomo. Former or late? Late. late. Well, yes. he was the former governor. Yes. And the late. And the late. I don't know, maybe late person did a Chelsea Manning thing or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, the judge is saying, uh, quoting, you know, uh, and I've got to, I think I put the post up. Maybe I well, did. Well, this is Roy Moore. He's saying our rights come from God because he was the right. guy that, and that he comes, was the guy that had the Ten Commandments in his, in his right, courtroom. Right. And that's what, you know, it's always been quoted that our rights come from God. That's from the Declaration of Independence and has been enshrined ever since by the Founding Fathers. And Chris Cuomo basically said, no, it's not. It comes from men and our collective agreement about what your rights are, which is an extremely scary thought. Because once it devolves from, men, from God, which is an absolute value, an absolute right, which shall not be touched, but when you get into the mindset that God no longer or nature's God no longer is important in this thing, and progressivism is nothing but relativism, 
that if men can decide what your rights are, then your rights aren't rights at all. They're just merely whims of the political wind at that particular time. And, and, and it's and, scary to think about that. And you have mob rule, yeah, uh, which is exactly what they designed the Constitution to prevent, not only by making the people the sovereigns, but by ensuring that the smaller political units had the strong control of, of local affairs, whether it be the towns, the counties, the states, and that all the way to the, the federal government, I nearly said the top, but really it's the bottom, is that the, uh, the individuals and the states exercise control thereover. Uh, and, of course, the you know, 17th Amendment undid some of that. People have such a... Uh flimsy grasp of the idea of natural rights. I mean, the minute you say God, you know, all the atheists and the agnostics are like, oh, God, God, run away, run away. You know, but really, we're talking, if you're talking about natural rights, you are born somewhere in the world, there is no civilization. What are your rights? You have a right to defend your person and your property. To speak? And you have the right to speak your mind. And, you know, there's other ones, but I mean, basically, I mean, those are the, those are the ones you can grasp. If you... We're born in the middle of a forest, and you and your family are there, and what? And, and you're scraping together a living in your cave. Do you have a right to what you've done? Do you have a right to defend your person? Or can somebody else in a different cave come and take it? Well, if they're Democrats. If they're Democrats, they can. You know, if, if, a, if a flock of ring-necked Hosmer geese come and they eat all your berries. And then poop all over your yard. <laughs> you know, like and geese, peck at you. Like, like geese do. And then get mad at you because they're pecking at you and you're trying to keep them away. You know, uh, people need to grasp it's so simple. It's really that simple. Well, well if, no, if, 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 if Democrats were just marauding geese... Uh, they'd all be dead by Well, I was talking about the natural rights, not the marauding geese. I mean, that's different. (laughs) Well, here's the deal. A right is something that you get, that you have innately, that you can uh, exhibit and exercise without the permission or dependency of anybody else. And the converse is also true. My right to free speech does not mean that you have to listen to me. You can walk away. You can walk away. You can even... Take your free speech and scream back at me. My right to self-defense is not dependent on anybody else. I, And, you know, we see the perversion of the word rights so often nowadays because, well, health care is a right. Education is a right. Uh, and it, say in the, in the gun rights environment, we're seeing I have a right to a safe environment. You have a right to educate yourself. You have a right to care for your own health right but in all you don't have of this, a right to make me do it but their version of a right means somebody else has to provide it for me i am entitled to the fruits of your labor i am entitled to your intellectual prowess or the strength of your back to, in order for me to exercise my full the, the, right and that's where i get upset because you're right steve they do the the, the educational system has so perverted our base understanding of what things are. I mean, there's no wonder why we're losing our republic. Well, that uh, that and I and I, I, you know, at a leadership level, uh, it's clear that the statists know what they're doing, and they know that the state has to take over everything in order to do what they want it to do and to keep them in power. At the lower level, I believe that people just think that it's the government tree and that they're entitled to the fruits thereof, and they have no knowledge of how that tree gets nourished. Uh, you know, unless we show it to them that the, uh, that the tree has to be nourished by the blood of revolution from time to time, uh, they don't understand that uh, what they pick off the branches of that tree is sucked out of our pockets by the roots. Well, it's, it's also the, the, the changes in culture. You think about, and, and this is, you know, speaking from, a, from a, a, a female's perspective, young women that were born after um, or, or, you know, in, in, in the few years leading up to the Supreme Court decision on Roe versus Wade, were, grew up in, in a world that said, well, yeah, abortion's not a big deal. And unless they took the time to educate themselves or their parents or their school or their church or their peers said, well, no, wait a minute, this, this is not what we believe, this is not what we think is right. Part of it is, unless your behavior has been corrected, you don't necessarily know. 
how many people rely on on their instincts to do the right thing. I think most people do. Okay, I hope most people do. But unless that behavior has been corrected, how do you know any different? In the abortion battles, I mean, things are getting a little better. I, I, overall, you've seen some improvement in perception about the debate on that issue. But it's been a long time, and it, it flipped so quickly that. You know, but it, but it's not even it's not even abortion. It's anything else that that culture. Mm. True. Deems is is okie dokie now. If you don't know any better, if this is what you learn, if this is what your peers believe, if no one has said uh, you're grounded, um, why why would you think any differently? How many people are independent students or thinkers? Well, now we have to go back into history and a part of history that most people don't understand. And you know, if I say the Frankfurt School here in this room, most of you will understand what that was. They make hot dogs, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. No. Okay. No, 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 no. This, this, you know, coming out of Prussia and Germany, this was the school of thought that was advancing socialism that was de rigueur they made in the wieners. 1880s. And, you know, when the wars were coming through, uh, they settled here in America to push progressive ideas. And they said, well, well, they'll never revolt here like they have in other countries. So we will have to change the culture. And that's when they ascended into the ivory tower and other areas to change the popular culture, including Hollywood, to unmoor us from our traditional values. Right. And yeah. that's what you see is we sure. are in a culture of war. We are in a we culture are, yeah, of yeah, values. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah, well, as I say, they would never revolt here. They, they knew that the people would not rise up at the government in the traditional sense because they didn't feel oppressed and because they knew they had the rights and the rights to defend themselves from government. So they've had to change the culture so that people don't perceive that they have the right to defend themselves from government and rather that they are subjects of government. Yeah. Yeah, fair statement. And and it's very clear when you look at, you know, the eldest significant other is going to school, elementary ed, special ed, and she was told outright, your job is to monitor parents. We cannot allow kids to have their parents' values, is, is, is what is the next step. And I have seen this and commented and blogged about it before. I would love to have that on video. I have some of that on video because I've been to the school board meetings. I mean at the ed level. Oh, at the ed level? That's... To have a professor teaching a future teacher... That that is their job. That's that would be earth shattering. If you go, to, there are a lot of progressive social justice warrior type sites. You know, we all seen have seen the examples of Common Core and some of the stuff that they're putting up, like the latest one going around. Again, I can't blog it all. I can't even get a, a, a gazillionth of it all up. But there's this political cartoon of the Democrat laying the bricks for the road for the poor. And the Republican on the other side taking up the bricks. I mean, that's the portrayal that we see essentially over and over again. The Republicans hate the poor, want to kill off the poor, and the Democrats love the poor. No, we don't want but, them to be poor anymore. Right. Yeah, well, that's and, a difference. And, 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 well, that's, and, the de- and the Democrats love the poor because they want there to be more of them. But the, 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 imagery is, the imagery is important because it sends a message and people connect right. to that message. And they believe what they see as... Correct, yeah. and it's not. And and you see, because it's harder to explain to somebody that whole "give a man a fish" thing. I mean, people are like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, aphorism, whatever it is, I don't care," you know. But until you put it into practice and say, "Look, ask yourself this question." We just like as an example, here's another couple hundred million dollars we're going to get from the federal government to give people health insurance because they got kicked off their other health insurance because of this particular piece of legislation or whatever we did. They became dependent. They need the money. And the people who gave it to you are so deep in debt that at some point they're going to have to cut something. Okay? Now, and you don't want it to be you, so you're going to vote for them. When all of that cutting starts, and we know it happens, it has to happen. There's no, you know. What it's happening here where they're taking money away from right. uh, se- senior. Uh, Hassan's already uh, doing it. Uh, you know, yeah. senior it's care one homes freaking that... year, not even 12 months, yeah. and we're already doing it. And so who do to... we blame? Yeah. Jeb Bradley, Jeannie Forrester. But you can't go to a well that's empty and think you're going to get a drink. That's the problem. And people have been convinced that there's always going to be water there. And there isn't. And when there isn't, that's why people 
are called preppers because they know that when you put everybody on welfare and the train hits the end of the tracks, somebody's going to be pissed off. Well, I mean, people getting ready for a snowstorm, all right? Think about it. When I was when I was coming back yesterday from uh, my Valentine lunch, um, we always look as we get off the exit there and see what's going on in the Market Basket parking lot. Oh, yeah, you'd think it was Armageddon. <laughs> You would absolutely think it's yeah, the, Ro- the Rhode Islanders joke about Cumberland Farms. Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and people, the shelves being emptied. That's the convenience store. Yeah, and they're going to Home Depot and looking for generators. Yeah, right? now. Or, or shovels. Shovels. Or snow no brushes. Oh, I, you know, and, and if there's not any, they're outraged. Well, you put me in that same group. I had to go buy a new shovel. The the youngest broke it. But different. Well, there you I go. There's a different, different thing. But two is one, and one is none. Yeah. So I bought two more. There you go. Okay, Go back I, to I, I, I had one slightly cracked shovel and one good one, and the handle broke on my good one. So now I have one good shovel because I put the pieces back together. There you go. <laughs> I mean, but it, 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 it's sad because when you, when you pit people one against the other and they have to worry about whether their kids are going to get fed or, I don't know, I guess that's the most elemental thing. Whether you've got a roof over your head or you can, you know, put gas in your car to go to work. When you're so, and we talk about this all the time, when you're so focused on making it through the night to the next day, all of this other stuff doesn't matter. And whoever is going to give some food to your kid so you don't have to kill somebody to get it, you're going to go back to them and you're, and you're not going to aggravate them because you need them for your child. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's how and, the, and that's how Democrat government would like you to be. Depend, exactly. And, and what is more pipe pipe evil? Pipe. What is more evil than holding your children hostage to force you to do what they want? You know, Romney certainly took it in the shorts about his forty-seven percent statement, but now we see the Democrats being open about it. You know, they've admitted we're doing this to get the votes. They've said it. I've read it. And these are not just the backbenchers. These are the sure. high-profile folks saying we need to do this. They want to change society, just like Labor did in Britain, where yep. they wanted a whole new population. Well, how's that working out for them now? Not no, so well. Not too well. Well, the other thing they wanted, of course, uh, you know, it was because they were effectively the party of the unions, they wanted communism. They wanted to nationalize every little bitty piece of business. I mean, they owned the telephones, the post office, the railroads, the sugar company, the steel company, the, the coal car mines, com- the car company, the coal mines. Yay, Josh it, is here. And and sure and sure enough, Mr. Bear. Sure, sure enough, most of it stopped working. Yeah, it did. You know, Margaret Thatcher was right. Okay, oh, we're going to take a quick break and swap some seats, and we'll be right back because our guests are here. Stay tuned. Cool. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. All right, this is Grok Talk. We got a lot of folks in here today. Just stick it on your head. <laughs> and uh, we're going to run this segment into the next segment because they just got here and we have plenty to talk about and all kinds of fun stuff going on in the great town of Guilford, New Hampshire, again, once again in the news. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Skip Murphy, Mike Rogers, Josh Yusuf, Mr. William Bear, Susan Olson is behind me, as is Marmar Rogers. That is correct. I am Steve McDonald. We are Grok Talk. You are. We are. We are. We all are. We all are. It's not the same without us. 
I mean, I may do a lot of the work, but it's not the same if we don't have everybody. Or at and least half of everybody. We're inclusive. We're inclusive. <laughs> we're a commune. It's a podcast commune. Let's not go that far. All right. Please. No, it's not. We're going to... Snap. We're gonna we're gonna stop the conversation that's going on over there, so we can do what we came here for, which was to have a conversation on the air. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna wait for Mr. Bear to put his headset on, and we're gonna talk about Guilford. You're all stretched out of there. I have a feeling there's a better conversation going on off there than on. That's just a feeling I have. All right. All right, here we go. Oh, everybody's here. So there's uh so I'm you know I'm I'm just kind of poking around the internet. <laughs> I just looked up. It's Mr. Incognito Man. Yeah, I just I uh. Ah, uh, fabulous. I'm poking around the internet and I Not ahead of- I find this nice article on WND with a picture of Josh's face and he's really happy. That, <laughs> that was an old old picture yeah. when I was happy. The, pic- the picture's out of context. Yeah, I know, but that's the picture they chose and then I'm like, "Well, what's this? What's going on here?" Oh man. And uh, I took a look and I'm like, "Oh, it's Guilford." <laughs> Yes. Welcome and I, home. And, Welcome. and I have to apologize to Josh. You sent me that stuff after the call, and then I got sick. And as I've been saying all morning so far, my, my memory is just so shot to ribbons that what I talk about in the beginning of the day, I can't remember that's what I'm supposed to be writing about by the end of the day. No worries. No worries. So well, please preface our, oh. our, our topic. Well, I'll pre- preface it by saying that in New Hampshire... Under RSA 570-A colon 2, individual citizens like all of us in the room here are prosecuted and find themselves on the chopping block with major prison penalties for wiretapping. And it was recently discovered by, actually, by Billy's children, and we kind of dug Again. in. Oh, we dug no. in. Well, we dug in a little deeper with some 91As <laughs> that the town of Guilford has, with impunity, been recording um, students wholesale, audio recording and video recording, with no notification on the buses, which is required under the statute, and um, they just think they can get away with this stuff. And, and so we, we submitted some 91As over to Kent Hemingway, which is the superintendent of the SAU, Where whatever it is. Where have I heard that name before? <laughs> 73, is that what it is? I think it's 73. SAU 73. And um, he called me, and so we had a brief conversation. He's like, oh, well, you know, we have it in our handbook, and our handbook's on the website. Do you want me to print that out for you? I'm like, no, that's fine. I'll, I'll take the one that's on, you know, on the website. That's so, fine. So this is, Billy, in the handbook, they actually cite the statute. They cite the statute. Verbatim. And so on the bus... There are absolutely no notices whatsoever, but the children, all 46 or 53 of them, or however many kids are on this bus, are being eavesdropped upon, not necessarily by a party to the conversation, but by a third party. Basically, it's an eye in the sky looking down and recording 40, 50, 60 conversations going on at any given time on every single bus. So over the course of how, how many years? Three, four, five years? It seems there like, we're not sure yet, but it seems of like tens of thousands of individual counts of illegal wiretapping going on by the town of Guilford and its partner, transportation partner, um, First, First, student. Student. First Student, which is, by the way, the largest transportation conglomerate in the world, $7 billion, headquartered in Great Britain, has 66,000 vehicles and 65,000 employees. Yeah. So this is not a company. This is not, you know... Bob and Sally's <laughs> bus company, and they, you know their compliance department, you know, is in a folder in their basement. This is a this is a company that has a legal team, presumably larger than the state of New Hampshire's legal team. Yeah. Now the question is, is when uh, when Kent said, "Well, it's posted on our website," um, can he prove when that was put up there? Because you know we're. Being the geeks that we are, we right. know that we can make a change to a, except for the Just New like Hampshire that. GOP, which doesn't seem to understand yeah, the concept. Yeah. They can't update their website, <laughs> yeah. you know, on time. But you know, you can update a website in thirty seconds if you want. From to. my phone, I mean, yeah. Um, well, here's the thing: the ninety-one A request, the first one is due today, so of course they'll have the benefit of Monday. No, they but, won't. That's right, because the snowstorm, right? No, <laughs> President's <laughs> Day. Oh, presidents and a snowstorm. So Tuesday, and then there's, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and there's another storm coming. So you might have to wait till the end. Of the well, week. The, and he'll close so school until the spring. <laughs> yeah, exactly. July fourth. So July fourth. <laughs> Groundhog Day means six more weeks for you waiting for your right. That's to know exactly right. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna know. Um, you know, we 
I think I shared the 91 days with you. Yes. We're very particular. And about, I will post them. Terrific. About the data that we're looking for. I mean, I want purchase orders. I want to know every conversation between um, and betwixt all of the people that um, are responsible for posting these <coughs> signs, signage manufacturers, um, paid invoices, distri bank distributions. I want to know specifically when these signs were posted at what point did they come into compliance? And then I want proof that they were in compliance up to the date, uh, the day before they proved that they were in compliance. Well, here's a, a little tangential offspring here. I was going to ask Ed about it because he was at the hearing. I read a piece on he was testifying at a hearing where they want to put through a bill that will allow government to more highly charge you for submitting such Request because that. it costs so much money to do this, and obviously, those in government are in favor of this. HB those... six forty six. Mm -hmm. yes. I called it uh, an act making public information a luxury item. Oh yes, you did. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad you got that. I'll probably put a luxury tax on it. Then then tax yeah. the costs on the right to know. Yeah. The, yeah okay. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I miss that because Avast kind of took over my computer. But, but I mean, what kind, what kind of transparency is that there, when you're isn't. burdening the the customer i almost call the uh the citizen right with a financial so, obligation yeah so i'm hoping that they won't stall long enough to see that bill pass and then they can go by well come today back is say, day number 10 well it's it's well they just have to tell you when they don't actually have to hand it over i haven't heard anything from them nothing well the, the reality is that there's um there's not that much that's in dispute kent hemingway essentially or in a in, literally admitted that they've been out of compliance. We have video that's really not quite public yet, um, video that shows that he said that there, there was only one bus that he knew of that was out of compliance. They've took care, taken care of it. They've remediated the problem. Everything's fine. Go back to work. Um, but the reality is we have video showing that there were at least half the fleet in Guilford, at least half the fleet that we've looked into, had was out of compliance that they had no signs that were posted in conjunction with the uh, audio and video. Okay. So. And off camera, we have a question from Susan. I need since, a fisheye lens. Since when uh, uh, are, are people cameras. allowed to <laughs> videotape minors at all without their permission or their parents' permission? Since when can you videotape a minor child? Without their knowledge or their parents' knowledge. There's actually an exception carved out in the statute to the wire t wiretap law. In the that you can videotape minors. It's actually a section um, entitled um, Video and Auto Recording on School Buses. So it's specifically tailored to school buses. And they said you're accepted from... The prohibition. <clears throat> Excuse me. From the prohibition on wiretapping, but you must follow these specific procedures they're, they're very simple and they're not I mean, owner they're not burdensome whatsoever the first procedure is that the school board needs to establish a policy and uh, permit this behavior to happen on the buses or this practice to happen and, and the and the policy just a footnote the policy needs to be approved by the parents there needs to be a public hearing public input um and uh so that that's really the component that's outstanding at this point. We're not sure if they even complied with that aspect of it before they implemented this uh, surveillance. We've so gone you're back suggesting, in the we're going to take a quick break and come back on this, um, but you might be suggesting that a school board kind of didn't want public comment? Is that... <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they no. Wouldn't, no, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't do that. All right, no. we're going to be right back. We're going to continue theory. this into segment four, and uh, we're going to suck all of segment four up with it because it's a great topic. We'll be right back. New Hampshire is famous for scenic drives, but they're tough to enjoy when you're on your way to the doctor. Because Obamacare limits your choices, some will have to drive more than an hour to see a doctor. What's health insurance worth if care isn't there when you need it? Jean Shaheen voted for Obamacare, putting your doctors and hospitals further out of reach. Tell Senator Shaheen, Obamacare is not working for New Hampshire. Jean Shaheen and her allies are making false claims about her record on veterans. The truth? Shaheen refused to meet with veterans pushing for reform, 
She wasn't on the committee that wrote the reform legislation and refused to co-sponsor important VA reforms in the VA Management Accountability Act until after the VA scandal broke. When our veterans needed her, Jean Shaheen was AWOL. Tell Jean Shaheen to stop distorting the truth and fix the VA. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning. The Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. All right. Grok Talk. Concord, New Hampshire, CNHT, GraniteGrok.com. Room full of people. And we're talking about Guilford, New Hampshire, and the school district. And some wiretapping violations, or the uh, presumption of such, well, and evidence, and, and all evidence kinds in of the whole nine, yeah. evidence in the whole nine, and there's evidence, and uh, it's Guilford. <laughs> you know, the thing that's particularly disturbing is that these people aren't contrite, and they weren't contrite when they made the the mistake, the uh, when they violated Billy's civil rights by mm-hmm. wrongfully arresting him, and then after they prosecuted him for seven months or eight months. And then the judge basically said, this is ridiculous. Oh, I know. I'm I paraf- read about that. I'm paraphrasing. I'm, congratulations, and, by the and, way. And, it's chilling. Those are the words. Yes. <laughs> well, that, and instead of, <laughs> thank instead you for of coming Carol out. Thank you for doing the right thing. Yeah. And instead of coming back and saying, you know, we, uh, we respect the court's opinion and, um, you know, we're, we're glad that we put this matter to bed. They doubled down and they said, well, we still think that he violated this and that. Oh, yeah. That was our that, police chief, oh, that's, too. Yeah, well. Our new police. That's another show. That's a whole. That's a separate show. <laughs> yes. Well, he well, well, maybe that might, might be to, the, that horse might have left the stable already. Yeah. We'll, we'll schedule that segment Together. later. Yeah, so, that, that's, so, another, that's maybe. Two but anyways, shows. the point is, is had had Guilford had Guilford been contrite and truly apologetic, they would have come out, gotten in front of the ball, put a statement on their website, on the SAU's website, and said, "Listen, we're." deeply apologetic we are very very sorry that we've been recording your children we didn't follow the policies um we we remediated the problem immediately and we're ready to take our penalty i would have a little bit of respect for them you know nothing like i'm gonna get quoted on this and i really don't care because being on the budget committee i've been seeing the same attitude from the guilford school board for years and it certainly hasn't changed Mm. and i'm going to say this I think we see sort of, uh, not sort of, but a definite trend towards autocratic despotism on that show. That's right. That that whole show that's called the school board. Um, and I'm going to blame Sue Allen. She's been one of the constants there. Kurt Weber has been as well since, mm-hmm. uh, since I got involved deeply into Guilford politics. He has decided not to run for re-election. Sue Allen has. But uh, I've already said I'm. I've signed up. I'm going to run for school board, Terrific. and one of my platforms will be greater civil engagement. Because right now, they don't. They believe they're above everybody else, and mm. this is just one more instance of who the heck are you to complain about us? That's right. Well, that's what I mean. You're saying above. They're they that now they're they're in a position where they're essentially saying that they're above the law. Yes, and very clear criminal statutes we're talking about here the idea we all know people who've been put in in state prison and in and in local jails for violating the same statute not with the school bus per se 
but you know, in other manners, without even, un- unfortunately, unwittingly sometimes, and they're prosecuted routinely in this state, and for the for this this municipality and for this school this school district and for this bus company to get away with this, possibly thousands and thousands and thousands of counts of illegal surveillance of our children who are minors is just absolutely outrageous. I mean, who do these people think they are that they could do this? And what is the community going to do? Well, we're we going to we're going to just say it's a mistake. It's for, it's for their safety. It was an oversight. Billy. It was it's an for their oversight. Safety. Same issue with notice. It was an oversight. And it's amazing that last time when I went through uh, it's amazing that I came from New Jersey thinking I was going to get more liberty and a little more <coughs> space and a little more freedom and this is what I find myself in. I but it's so. absolutely am- cuz I I've, I've never been involved with things like this in in other areas. I'm just curious were these buses built with these cameras in them or did they no, have been retrofitted okay that's an interesting conversation isn't it certainly it? is and you're looking is. for information about that as well right is that part well, yeah. of the process of we the want doc- to know the date purchase the cameras, orders and exactly the purchase orders for the cameras yeah, because the you don't i mean installed. i mean you don't accidentally kill somebody while you're cleaning your knife and you don't accidentally put a camera in a bus that didn't have one it yeah. just doesn't happen <laughs> well like, it's premeditated like, like, and deliberate you, you go in with your electronics bag and you go out and the <laughs> camera's mounted where's that camera <laughs> you know th- this is really a very simple it's it's aside from the the the, the aspect of the statute in which they uh, probably may not have complied, that is the proper procedure to implement this, this policy and the, these cameras, the, this uh, surveillance to begin with. It's an, uh, it's an issue of notice again, just like with what happened to me with my daughter. If they should have told me it was in the book and we could have discussed it and they should have been honest about what the, the offending parts might be and we could have made an informed decision. But that's not what happened. It's the same thing again. It's a, it's something it's they will not tell you what they're doing. They refuse to be transparent on what they're doing and now they're violating criminal statute. Yeah. And it's just it cannot it cannot stand. You know, it, it all goes back to our friend Ian Underwood when he first testified on the gun uh bills last year that if our elected legislators cannot respect our fundamental law, which is the constitution and the plain words therein, why should we obey your laws. And from what I understand, and I wasn't there, um, there was a lot of disconcerned looks on the uh, the folks that were listening to the testimony. They just, what? And, you know, they, th- they think it's a given that they can write the laws for everybody else, that the laws that are in place are for everybody else, as you said, Billy, except for them. And we're seeing this over and over and over again. You know, we we talked earlier about Obama's uh, executive amnesty, about basically becoming citizens by de facto, and the earned income uh, credits that were started to be brought up, where the IRS has just decided, oh, well, they are now owed or entitled to three years' worth of back earned income tax credits up to $27,000 a year. And I'm going, this is... My dismay that I expressed earlier is like, what is this country coming to? We used to value the rule of law, and now we see those in government openly flaunting it. And I can give you example after example after example after example after ex- Okay, that's enough. Over and over again of where if, our, if those in government aren't going to follow the law or create law, um, let's see, who was it? This, Just, is, this is where you get to tax evasion in think, failing uh, societies. I think that... Um, this is uh, button pushing. I think, I think, at least on some level, they want very desperately to have an excuse to declare martial law. 100%. And they are doing everything they can to piss off everybody they can so that somebody starts a rebellion somewhere and revolts and that there's arms involved and they will then bring the hammer down, call in the National Guard, and, 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 and I'm going to hand my headset to Susan. Hang on. Back home in Texas, we call it trade and licks until somebody has had enough. So that's that's kind of what's happening. But you also have to figure they're going to win either way because while they're pushing our buttons, they are acclimating the masses to this new operating procedure, this new standard operating um, model. So many of the people that aren't um, interested in their privacy and their gun rights and their First Amendment rights, people that just could care less, they want to go along, they trust the government, they believe the government's there – they're going to go along with this new ratcheted up version of the government. Whereas if they do revolt, then they create... A, so under that first premise, they've now got more people on their side. And alternatively, they push the wrong button, one of our buttons, so to speak, and they have an excuse to declare martial law. Yes, Reverend Nehemiah 
first they came for the Jews. That's it, yep. So as you think, um, back to Guilford. And this yes. bus company is this huge company. I mean, what what degree of involvement are you? Do you expect a lot of pushback from a bit the Big Brother bus line or whatever you want to call them? When you say pushback, I mean, what, like well, I mean they're involved somehow, right? Well, I mean, gonna, it's their buses. And, right. And, well, they'll blame it on the school board. The school board will blame it on them. They'll probably blame it on my kids for you know talking on the bus or something yeah. that they they should. How dare you notice there's cameras yeah, on here? I mean, like, whatever. <laughs> so I mean, basically, it's it's we're gonna see we're gonna see what this legal system's really about. I mean, unfortunately, I have some. Experience. That's a very bad experience um, with how this works. I mean, Josh and I were just talking about this in the car. Um, I worked in the district attorney's office in Bronx County in New York City for two years um, in a major offense bureau. All felonies, murders, kidnappings, rapes, hum, everything, um, armed robberies. And uh, I literally saw people walk out of the courtroom um, who, who literally got away with murder. I saw it every day. And uh, and now I'm seeing it from the other perspective. I'm seeing innocent people who are, are pursued by the government for doing nothing, for doing nothing illegal or immoral or, you know, and it, this is happening. And uh, these people, this bus company and this school district, needs they need to be held accountable to the same criminal statute that we're held accountable for, uh, to, excuse me. And uh, if not, that it's, it's really over. It's really over. This is like the, the mop-up operation as I see it. It's, well, uh, it's I, that far gone. I'm not so sure that we're quite to the mop-up operation. I think this is building up to, uh, as Ed said, a tipping point in the last segment uh, before you guys came in. And I, I really believe it's right because, you know, the model is the organizer-in-chief. The, the basic thing is to rub the wound raw and keep rubbing and keep rubbing and rubbing. That's the Alinsky way. And we're seeing this over and over again. We see the IRS Koskinen, um, or what's his title, commissioner, saying, uh, you know, stalling on the lowest learner emails until it finally comes out. We see that, uh, you know, now if you don't give us our money, everybody's going to get bad customer service. You know, it's thing after thing after thing where it just never stops. And it's replicated over the entire of this Leviathan government. We've always had the petty despots at the local level. You know, the good old boys at the local level already you know, running it. And we see this in the Guilford School Board, which is one reason why I'm running to say, you know, I've always been about the taxpayer first. That the spending should never rise above that of the average family in town. That it should be open and transparent. I mean, there... They've got plenty to work. They will have plenty to work with. I've got Guilford Rock and Granite Rock for them to pick and choose with. I expect to get everything thrown at me for this, and I'm going to laugh because we can do the same thing. But I guess even though I lament that this is happening, happening, it's still up to folks like us who are interested in the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, you know, due process, and all of that that have to make that stand because we are the sheepdogs. We are the ones who are looking out for those that just want to live their lives, you know, build up their careers, take care of their families, be happy with their friends, you know, their pursuit of happiness. Face it, folks, the reason why we're all in this room, we are the sheepdogs. Just very briefly, at what price are we the, the watchmen or the sheepdogs? Um, everybody's going to have that price. I, I know that I have paid, you have paid, we all pay in one way or another. The question is, is what is that ultimate line that you will not cross, or is there no line at all? I mean, it really depends on how far things get pushed. And we may not know. We may say what we know what that line is. We may say that there's no line, but until that time comes, we don't know. I don't think any of us can And, and what are we say. trying to save? I, th I believe that the idea of a limited government, that the people are the sovereigns, that government should serve us and not the way around, that I believe that we are seeing a government that is trying to take the place of the old-time aristocracy and clerisy that we fought a revolutionary war for back in the 1770s. The problem is that so many people today, over the past 40 years, <coughs> of this new education that people have been gotten, and getting in America. that's the problem. We now have a populace that's dominated by dummies. People that are just... Ignorant. I don't mean that. I don't mean that offensively. Although people, I expect, will take offense to it. Ignorance They're, might be a better word. Yeah, well, I mean, you're, you're young enough to have been through that education I did. system, but you, I, but you didn't succumb to it because I resisted it. I resisted it. But the problem is, is most people are trained to just shut up and listen to the authority. 
I think you're seeing a change in that. And you started to see that with the Tea Party. Thank you, Mrs. Obama's school lunch program. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that is causing some... You have no mic. Yeah, I... I yeah. Oh, he can't not talk. Let's go. Give him a mic. Give him a headset. He's got something to say. Mike can't mic. So, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, that, that uh, school lunch program is causing such burning resentment that you might actually uh, inoculate some kids against the indoctrination system. But the point I wanted to make earlier, there was a comment captured, I think, during his San Francisco fundraiser on his way to, guess what, golf in a place where you shouldn't be wasting water on golf courses, uh, in that he said he's going to try to squeeze as much change into the next two years as he can. You talk about tipping points? Over to you. <laughs> All right. So. But back to Gil- Back to Guilford. So w- you've issued the 91 A's. You haven't received anything back as of yet. What is the next step in the process, if there is indeed a process? Well, just, just we have received some links back to their policy, which is really an admission that they knew what the law was. So we have And then we have the signs that magically appeared last Tuesday. So that's a de facto admission of non compliance. <laughs> so and then we have then we have an actual admission of non compliance by Kurt uh, by Kent Hemingway saying that at least one bus was out of compliance. So we have that too. So is it okay to break the law once in a while or do you have to break it wholesale in order to get prosecuted for it? <laughs> I mean, do you need to break the law on all the buses in order for it to be a crime? Or can you just break it in one? I mean, if we speed once in a while, that's when we get caught, right? Well, it goes back again to Ian Underwood's either words have meaning or they have no meaning at all. And I think that's the basis where I could answer your question is one is sufficient, especially where we should be holding government to a much higher level of accountability. Mm. Kent Hemingway is an appointee, but, you know, there is a school board. Voter Votes are coming up, but I think we do have the legal process. We are supposedly under the rule of law and having that process through, although you know, they're going to do the same thing over and over again. They're going to drag this out for as long until you give up, if you give up. This is a I, war of attrition, and they're hoping we're going to is. give up first. It, it always is. And with these kinds of people, and I'm going to say Sue Allen, Kurt Weber, uh, they dislike intensely being challenged that's right that is you know they're ensconced in their own little world where they are king and queen and uh how dare you challenge them i mean if you want to even think about the whole concept of prosecutorial discretion a a prosecutor could say listen i'm going to opt not to pursue this but that's when there's some wiggle room in the statute when you have the facts 100 percent established and not in dispute whatsoever and you have the law very clearly written in black and white letters or black letters on white paper, there's nothing in dispute here. There's no discretion. There is no room for them to shimmy in and out and exercise any prosecutorial discretion. This is almost like, in the civil sense, a summary judgment. It's you go in and there's no facts in dispute and you're entitled to a matter of a judgment as a matter of law. The judge just says, here you go, buddy. Well, good point. The question is, what is the remedy? Well, for the 91A, I mean, if we have to go for um, an expedited hearing at the Superior Court, that's the next step. If I don't hear from them, then I, what, what are the recourses there? No, no my, my question will be, whenever you take somebody to court, there has to be a problem, which you've now stated, and the court is supposed to supply some kind of remedy. Now, you're not a resident of Guilford. Correct. So, so the, the extent of my standing so we'll, is the 91A. Right. The, the other th- question will be, is, and, and I can't, I would not have standing, even though I'm a Guilford resident, I don't have kids that have been on that bus. You weren't an injured party. That is well, correct. We're talking about two, but, but we're two, yeah, but we're talking about two different tracks. There's the criminal track, which we don't need standing for. This is a matter of telling the prosecutor, this is what's going on, now do something about it. Go prosecute. That's what you're getting paid for. That's the first track. The second track is like you identified the civil track, which is obviously you need standing, you need to... Sh- you need to ostensibly show damages what's interesting which we didn't touch on is that this statute very clearly provides for um, recovery with no actual damages it provides for liquidated damages at $100 a day per incident 
Oh. Okay. So in that case, and and punitive damages. So the legislature took this very, very, very seriously. Liquidated damages are unusual, especially in a criminal statute where they cite it to the potential civil lawsuit. So in my case, for instance, my children have been on that bus for approximately a year and a half, be, being illegally listened to by a third party. Okay, without proper notice, without proper compliance with the statute. We figured it out. It's basically $50,000 in liquidated damages, $100 per incident, liquidated damages per day. Wow, okay. that could add and, up quite a bit. And then there's punitive damages, which when you're dealing with a $7 billion multinational national New World Order corporation and an insurance company who obviously is going to be involved with this, okay, you know, now punitive the, damages would be interesting. Okay, side issue. Push your windscreen down again. That I got to bring that mic home. No, the the covering. The little oh, foamy sorry. thing on the front there. Yeah. Okay. There you go. But the the question is though, you can go after the commercial entity, and that is one thing. But if you go after civil damages, the hundred dollars a day, the school board's going to be associated with that. What is your answer to say, okay, if we have to pay this as the school board, it's going to result in higher taxes for everybody to pay this. In one way, or uh, would it be possible to go after these individuals that made the decisions, the school board, and sue them personally and hold them personally accountable so it doesn't come out of the taxpayers' pockets, but will it come out of their personal pockets? Is that something that's possible? It makes no difference. It's probably you still have no mic, Mike. Need more money to get more of these headsets. Yeah, it'll make no, it'll make no difference because they've if if the school board is smart, they'll have some kind of director's insurance uh, protecting them from being individually well, sued. I'm sure they have insurance. Uh, pardon? Um, they have insurance. I'm quite yeah, sure. Yeah. So so the school board, you know, it, it'll come out of the town's pocket, but in the form of increased insurance premiums. Not to say that uh, it shouldn't happen. The question is. Okay, on the one hand, it's your town and you're hurting yourself. On the other hand, if you don't make an example of somebody, they'll keep on doing it everywhere. And the, the final point is it's per person day. So, you know, however many schools are in the school district times, the number of days this has been going on uh, uh, you know, unannounced is the amount they're liable for, which is going to be huge. And if we find the same corporation is doing it in other states, in other towns, the amount you can go after the school, after the company for, is uh, potentially, uh, 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 you know, off the charts. Well, my son goes to Stratum Memorial School in Stratum, uh, which is SAU 16. I can't keep all these subdivisions organized <laughs> in my head. Anyway, so I went to pick him up from school the other day, and I just decided I'd peek on one of the buses. And I asked the bus driver, um, is it customary practice for SAU 16 or whatever? This was a random bus. This was completely random because my son doesn't ride the bus on Wednesdays because I pick him up. So I walk up and they go, oh, yeah, we audio and video record. Okay, so I look up, no sign. He was in a rush to move his bus forward, so I decided to go to the next bus and repeat the operation. So I went in with my camera on and I video and audio recorded. I gave the woman notice, you're being video and audio recorded. And I'm wondering, is it customary practice for you people to video and audio record the students? Yes, it is. Is it practice all throughout the SAU? Yes, it is. It's been going on for a while? Yes, it is. I look, I pan up to the front of the bus. There's no notice. <sighs> I look to the side of the bus. Who's running the bus? Our friends in uh, Great Britain. Yeah. Well, here's the problem. We're seeing this in a variety of different locations where the local school boards, we've, we've seen Dover, Maltonboro, Guilford, um, oh gosh, what's the rest? I've just gone blank. But there's probably five or six um, Interlakes, uh, Hampton, where all of these school boards are taking this autocratic standpoint or outlook upon those that have elected them. Hmm. They're supposed to be serving. Government is supposed to do the things that we pay them to do. They are our employees, but they're trying to reverse the the whole relationship here. And and Right, the servants We're, have become the masters, and the, the lawmakers have become the lawbreakers. Have become the lawbreakers. Well, Mama, Mama like had asked while we were talking how many districts do this, and I think we're going to find out. I think it's going to be massive. And I we're going to f- we're going to probably find out that they are scurrying right now to retrofit buses all over the state of New Hampshire, and that needs to be um, uncovered. But that just stops the bleeding. That doesn't account for the blood that's been lost. I mean, there's been a lot of blood loss. There's been a lot of crimes committed. The crimes have been continuing. Up until the time that they do retrofit these buses with the signage and the notice and what have you. But 
If there is no cr penalty, there is no reason for the law, period. Well, there is no rule of law. Susan. Could you ostensibly subpoena individual bus drivers to say when that sign went up? A hundred percent. Once we file a lawsuit. And, of course, the, the, the uh, prosecutor could do that, of course, yeah. And most likely those school bus drivers would be paying their own legal fees. Uh, I would tend to think not. I mean, I, I don't they know. Would get, the bus company would jump in for them, and that would... Maybe. Are they employed by the bus company, or are they employed by the district? The drivers are employed by the bus company. Okay. Well, that's that's very interesting, because there's a lot of bus drivers out there. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they're, they're uh, 60, 65 or 66,000 employees of first student. So in New Hampshire? All over the world. No, all over the world. Ah. Are but they part of Bluebird? Is I, that the same thing? That's Bluebird the is a manufacturer of the bus. They actually, um, the same company owns Greyhound. They're a humongous. And Bolt, Bolt Bus. Bolt I, Bus, yeah. yeah the, that's what brought down um, the Suharto family in Indonesia, just so you know. Really? The daughter... Um, owned the bus company and it was uncollateralized and they international bankers came in and said um, how's that working for you all right wow. so everybody should be doing 91 a's in their towns for purchase orders for signs to be put on buses <laughs> and the thing of it is is they may be able to escape that that particular line of questioning because they presumably the superintendent makes a phone call over to the bus manager and says hey you guys are not in compliance, and we're taking a lot of heat for this. So then the bus company, which is not subject to 91A, will... No, but the conversation from the, conversation the back and forth is, is correct. And that's what we've asked Except for those... Except in Timberlane. We've yeah, asked yeah, for those that's records another as well. One. Yeah. We've asked for all those conversations. So, cool. All right, well, it's a big deal. I mean, people are like, oh, you know, they don't realize. I mean, we have this law. It's very strict. It's very detailed. I mean, the freaking district has a policy in its own manual that it's violating. But the Safety Sally Society that we live in right now is all about protecting the children. And what would you do if your son got beaten up on a bus and it wasn't on video? You same people would probably be complaining that there were no cameras. My kids well, went to public school on the buses and the crap that goes on. <laughs> well, the thing is, no, none of, neither of us, and I haven't heard anybody like who is sympathetic, let's say, to my position or Josh's position, argue that Video cameras and audio recording should not be on the school bus. I've never said that. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I haven't even really thought about it. That's not the point. Mm -hmm. The point is very focused and very simple. These people are breaking the law. They haven't given notice. And my son and my daughter are sitting on that bus for a year and a half having conversations with each other, having conversations with friends about who knows what. Well, like I said, who knows who knows what is the bus company and the school. I don't know what they said, but they know what my children said. And they were recorded illegally. That's what's going on. This isn't about safety. Mm -hmm. we, that's a different discussion. We might all say after we get all the facts that cameras should be on school bus and there should be audio recording. That's fine. The legislature allowed for that. They just said, here, everybody else is banned. We're going to carve out an exception for you. But there's a couple of little rules you have to follow. Please follow the rules. And they didn't follow the rules. It's yeah. that simple. And it really shows which is more important in most people's minds. And I think you're right, Billy. Most people would say, stop, you know, stop the fighting. Well, unfortunately, the rights, as we've talked about a number of times, seems to be a much more nebulous idea for today's society yet we all know in this room that those rights the due process the rule of law without that we wouldn't be a republic without the uh, respect for the right to private property we wouldn't be a republic due process we really wouldn't be a republic those three things are very much important but because of our well, educational system they're people subsumed. have lost interest in that well or they don't understand the importance of them that those undergird all the well, rest this of this is clearly stuff. going to be characterized as a it's going to be a false choice between <coughs> school safety and and recording and okay. that's not the choice well you've made we it quite have, clear we could have both you made it quite follow clear the what law. the issue is they didn't follow, follow the, the law, law and that's where we're going this is Grok talk we'll be back we uh, we will be back after next i week. stumble next week more guests more news more opinion more Grok talk Yeah, baby! When asked whether she still supports Obamacare, Senator Gene Shaheen said...
yes, I do continue to support the law. We're beginning to see some positive results. How can Senator Shaheen say we're seeing positive results when 22,000 of our neighbors have already lost their health insurance? What's worse, the Boston Globe reports the state's only health insurance provider radically reduced the number of hospitals in their network, forcing some people to drive over an hour for lab work, even when there's a hospital within a few miles of their home. When pressed about lack of access, Shaheen said... There are some hospitals that are not covered, unfortunately, and um, I, I certainly hope that's going to change. Jean Shaheen promised us we could keep our doctors and our health care coverage. Now she hopes we can get to a local hospital? Call Senator Shaheen at 603-647-7500. Tell her we need more than hope. We need leadership. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Senator Jean Shaheen said, if you like your current health plan, you can keep it. That's not true, Senator. 22,000 New Hampshire citizens have been kicked off their insurance plans. Hospitals in Rochester, Concord, and Portsmouth, they aren't allowed to provide care under the exchange. Senator, you were wrong in your comments. You should apologize for your misleading remarks. I'm calling Senator Shaheen at 750-3004 and telling her I want my doctor back. You should, too. Paid for by SaberPack.org, not authorized by any candidate or candidate committee. All of the music on this program comes to us through Creative Commons licensing from Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. The opinions expressed on this program are those of the speakers, not necessarily those of CNHT, GraniteRock.com, or anyone else for that matter. Rock Talk.